You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's taking my hand. Got a million better put on the road. I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the eighth part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Hey, All Might. Tagata gently shook the older man by the shoulder to wake him up. They just announced that we're going to land soon. All Might blinked away the vestiges of sleep as he registered what his successor said. Ah, thank you, young Mirio. He noticed that the young man was already in his costume. Looks like I'd better follow your example. Hey, maybe you should wait a little longer. Tagata chuckled. Najire is still getting changed. Amajiki, who was reading a book on the other side of the cabin, rolled his eyes. She's been in there for almost an hour, doing her hair. She'll probably give you about five minutes. Oh, right, thank you again. All Might was still getting used to Hato and Amajiki knowing about his true form. But Tagata had argued long and hard that they were trustworthy, and All Might had finally given in. Surprisingly, the other two parts of the big three were less shocked than he'd expected. They had stared, blinked like they couldn't believe it, and asked questions, but there was none of the brain-halting shock that Midoriya had shown when they'd spoken on that rooftop over a year ago. When he'd asked why they weren't completely freaking out, they'd just shrugged and said they'd heard stranger things. Even Tagata explaining one for all and if convincing All Might to tell them about his true form had been a challenge. Getting him to tell the truth about his quirk had been even worse hadn't surprised them too much. All Might didn't press, after all, the internet was a thing. Finally, Hato emerged from the bathroom, though she was still brushing her hair as she sat down next to Amajiki. Like Tagata, they were both in costume. All yours, All Might. Thank you, young Hato. One of the benefits of being the top hero in Japan was his own private plane, which came stocked with everything he could ever need for a trip including a bathroom fit for a five-star hotel. It took him only a minute to get into his costume, though he refrained from transforming just yet. As he emerged from the bathroom, Hato tried not to laugh. All Might didn't blame her. Even he could admit that he looked silly wearing a costume that, for the moment, was about ten sizes too big. Just so you three know, I'm going to have to maintain my muscle form constantly, he said, and rubbed a hand over his eyes. Oh, this is going to be exhausting. Don't worry, Tagata said cheerfully. If you need a break, we'll cover for you. Thank you, young Mirio, but this trip is supposed to be about you. Although All Might did have a personal reason for visiting I Island. As the next symbol of peace, you'll need connections, and the I Island Expo is the best place to find them in the international community. He shrugged. If it means ensuring your future success, I can bear it. An obnoxiously upbeat ringtone started playing from inside one of Hado's gauntlets. She opened up a compartment and pulled out her phone. Hey, hey, guess who just landed at I Island? Izuku nervously tugged at his sleeve as he and his mother stepped off the plane. It felt weird wearing his costume in public without a license. The last time had been during his internship with Hawks, but he didn't have a hero with him today. I've seen pictures of you in your costume before, Izuku, but it looks even better in person. It hadn't taken long for Izuku and his friends to get Nezu's permission to bring their costumes to I Island. While they were going there to have fun, there was also a good chance that they would make connections that would bear fruit in their careers as heroes. Nezu only asked them to make good decisions before letting them take their costumes. Th thanks, mom. He waited until they passed through a security station before speaking again. Dad is supposed to be just past the entrance, right? That's what he said. Inko smiled. She missed her husband every day and was looking forward to seeing him again. But Izuku was unable to hide his excitement. He looked ready to charge ahead at any moment. She didn't blame him. The last time Izuku had seen his father in person, his prospects had been bleak, to say the least. With no quirk, and no realistic way of achieving his dream, Hisashi had left his son while he was slowly sinking into depression. Now, Izuku was well on his way to being a hero, with a boost in confidence, friends, and even a girlfriend. As they passed through the entrance to I Island proper, Inko nearly made herself dizzy trying to look at the technological wonders that stood, walked, or flew around her, while also looking for her husband. Mom, there he is. Inko followed her son's pointing finger, and her heart skipped a beat. Isashi looked the same as he did the last time he was tall, nearly a foot taller than his son, 
and a bit on the skinny side, with hair just as messy as Izuku's, but black with streaks of early gray. His eyes were narrower than his son's he had gotten those, along with the tear ducts, from his mother but those eyes widened at the sight of his family. Inko, Izuku, Hisashi sprinted over to them, he reached Inko first, picking her up and spinning her around. Once again, Inko was happy she'd lost all that weight. Two years ago, Hisashi wouldn't have been able to do this. I'm so glad to see you. Inko's laughter was cut off when Hisashi leaned down to kiss her, thanks to his quirk. His breath was almost uncomfortably warm, but she didn't mind. After a few seconds, the kiss ended, and Hisashi stepped back, but only so that he could look at his son. For his part, Izuku was a little embarrassed by his parents' public display of affection, but he was also fascinated by it. He knew his parents loved each other, but since his father was away for so long, he hardly ever got to see it. Hey, kiddo, Hisashi said, and enveloped Izuku in a hug. It's so good to see you again. Why, yeah. Izuku returned the hug, though tears quickly spilled from his eyes and onto his visor. I am missed you, dad. Hisashi chuckled. You and your mom with those tears. Izuku pulled off his visor and wiped his eyes. Eh, sorry. Don't apologize. Hisashi ruffled his son's hair. Also, that costume is awesome. I love the ears on the hood. They're not Izuku's protest died when he saw his parents' teasing smiles. Oh, mom told you already, didn't she? Of course she did. Hisashi grinned wider and put one arm around Inko's shoulders, and the other around Izuku's. Come on, let's go explore a bit. There's plenty of time before the preview. I hope you brought some formal wear. They had, as a matter of fact, the preview was a more formal event, and while Izuku could have worn his costume to it, People who weren't pro-heroes were encouraged to come in civilian attire. He could wear his costume for the rest of the expo, though. The island was filled with things that blew Izuku's mind. He saw flying cars, solid holograms, and what he swore was an actual lightsaber being used to simultaneously cut and cook a steak. Some things just looked like they went beyond science and into the realm of magic. There were also so many different quirks on display everything from simple mutations, to elemental powers, to a man who created portals to other locations whenever he sneezed. Back in Japan, people used their quirks for little things, but it was always on the down low, in case someone went after them for improper quirk use. Here, there was no scrutiny, just freedom. Even his parents were getting in on the fun when they stopped to buy some food. Inko summoned the food to her hands when it was ready, and when his sashis wasn't as cooked as he would have liked. He breathed fire on it until it was charred on the edges. This is place is great, Hisashi said. Enjoying yourselves, boys. For a moment, Izuku was confused at the plural, but then Ben spoke from inside the Ultimatrix. I'm so glad I can observe everything at once, because this is so cool. It was a little strange hearing Ben act like a teenager and not the wise AI he was, but it also felt natural, like he was a part of the family. Hey, Izuku, you just got a message, Ben added. And I'm only saying so because you probably can't hear your phone over all the noise. I'm not your secretary. Izuku pulled out his phone and saw that his friends had started messaging him. Comet, Deku-kun, did you land? How was your flight? Tape, yeah, most of us got here an hour ago. Can't find Shoto or Mina, though. Book, they probably found a quiet corner to kiss in. Crayon, Ejkag is no Renat. Book, vengeance is mine. Frog, looks like Mina can dish it out, but can't take it, Ribbit. Snowflake, we're by the big arena. It's about three blocks away from the entrance. All Might, hi, everyone. The flight was fine. I'll try to meet up with you soon, but I'm with my parents. Izuku's phone was suddenly ripped from his hand and flew into Inko's. She glanced at the screen, shared a nod with Hisashi, and then handed it back. We can meet up with your friends, honey, we have all weekend to spend with each other, and we'd love to meet the friends you talk about so much. And I'd love to meet your girlfriend, Hisashi chimed in. Izuku blinked, and then slowly turned back to his phone. All might, never mind, we'll be there in a few minutes. Deku-kun, Izuku barely opened his arms in time to catch Yuraraka as she flew literally, with the aid of her quirk into his arms. She hugged him tightly, and then gave him a quick kiss on the cheek. H hi, Ochako, he said nervously, expecting his father to react any second now. Sure enough, he did. Boo, throw a chan in there, make it sound like you care. Izuku's hood was down, but he dearly wished it was up, so that he could hide his blush. Yuraraka was in costume as well, but had attached her helmet to her belt, she was as red-faced as her boyfriend. Behind her, Siro and Ishida were cackling, and everyone else also in costume was trying to stifle their own laughter and failing miserably. Everyone, these are my parents, Izuku said wearily as he gestured to said parents. Mom, Dad, these are my friends. And girlfriend, Hisashi said with a grin at Yuraraka. Please tell me you all have been teasing him. 
Ashido smiled back, even before they started dating. Isashi patted his son on the back. You have good friends, Izuku. Hiroraka glared at the other rising stars. We're about to have a few less friends, because I'm about to send them into the sun. Asui tilted her head. That'll be hard, since you're still holding on to Izuku, Ribbit. Everyone laughed, even Izuku, as Yuraraka chased Asui around the table they'd been sitting at, until Asui hopped onto a nearby tree, out of Yuraraka's reach. She didn't come down until Yuraraka promised not to chase her anymore, but only because Siro promised to restrain Asui with his tape if she teased further. Ashido waggled her eyebrows at him. Kinky. At that point, everyone just fell apart laughing. Even Todoroki couldn't stop smiling, though he flicked Ashido's ear for her comment. Hyeyarazu wiped away a tear and then looked up at the arena. What is this place, anyway? It's for showing off combat-related quirks, Todoroki answered. We can go in and fight robots. The goal is to destroy them as quickly as possible. Edda looked intrigued. That could be interesting. Does anyone want to give it a try? Seven hands rose in answer. Isashi put an arm around his wife's shoulders. Looks like we'll be able to see what Izuku can do with our own eyes. Like their juniors, the big three were just as impressed with Eye Island. Tagata in particular looked like he wanted to examine everything and probably would have, if not for All Might keeping a firm grip on his shoulder. He could have used permeation to easily escape, but it was the principle of the matter. This place is amazing. Hato squealed as she floated overhead. I've never been to a place where I can fly as much as I want. Hey, Tamaki, you should join me up here. Amajiki hesitated, but after an encouraging nod from Tagata, he reached into one of his pouches and ate some chicken. His arms turned into wings a moment later, and he joined Hato in the air. She giggled and poked him, and he couldn't retaliate, since he didn't have arms. All Might gave his signature booming laugh, made all the more impressive in his muscle form. It did his heart good to see people, especially students he genuinely liked, enjoying themselves so much. The joy died in the face of one of his enduring fears. Students, I hope you don't mind if I zip ahead for a bit. I love my fans, but I'd rather avoid getting mobbed this early in the day. I'll meet you in the courtyard up ahead. Tagata eyed the distance between him and where All Might was pointing. Race you there, guys. He sank into the ground and vanished. All Might moved at his typical blinding speed, leaving only a strong gust of wind to mark his passing. That's so not fair. Hado whined. They've got super speed. We never said we'd race them back, Amajiki pointed out. I guess you're right, Hado said, and then flew higher. Come on, let's go flying. Amajiki followed, but he kept an eye on All Might and Tagata when he popped out of the ground. He watched as the two shared words, but he was too far away to hear what they were saying. Then he saw someone, a blonde-haired girl, hop over to them on what looked like a pogo stick. At first, he thought it was another All Might fan, but then he saw the man give her a big hug. Nejire, who is that? Amajiki didn't have hands to point with, but Hado followed his gaze. I don't know, but All Might does. Come on, let's go. Amajiki sighed to himself as he followed after her. And I was hoping forget it. The girl turned out to be very pretty, with long, wavy hair and glasses. She wore white pants and a white shirt, over which she had a red vest and a plaid bow tie. She had just finished giving All Might a hug and was now talking to Tagata. I love that cape, she said in English. Does it ever get in the way when it's windy? Sometimes, Tagata admitted, also in English, and then saw Amajiki and Hado land. Oh, these are my friends from school Amajiki Tamaki and Hado Nejire. Oh, wait, I guess you'd say their names the other way around, right? The girl smiled and waved him off. It's fine. Actually, I can speak fluent Japanese if that makes you more comfortable. That's not a problem, Hado said in English. I never get to talk to anyone in a different language outside of classes, so this is cool. Amajiki mumbled something that might have been a greeting. There were no walls to face, so he hid behind All Might. Sorry, I should introduce myself. The girl smiled at them. My name is Melissa Shield. Uncle Might didn't say he was bringing guests, but it's nice to meet you. Even Tagata was stumped for a second. Uncle Might. All Might laughed again. Melissa is the daughter of one of my dearest friends. She's called me her uncle since as long as I can remember. He paused. Say, Melissa, I was hoping to surprise your father. Does he still spend this time of day in his lab? Melissa laughed right back. You know him too well, Uncle Might. If you want to surprise him, I could show these three around. All Might's smile somehow became even brighter. Your kindness knows no bounds. Thank you very much. He headed off towards several official-looking buildings. I'll catch up with you this evening for the preview. The big three knew he would probably rest in order to conserve his time limit, but they didn't say anything. All Might had told them that no one on I Island knew his secret, so they assumed that also meant Melissa. He seems as energetic as ever, Melissa commented. It's like he can never stay still. Tagata chuckled. 
probably a side effect of always running around saving people. You're probably right. Still, I hope he enjoys the weekend with Papa. Those two haven't seen each other in years. She gestured for them to follow her and then continued talking. So, you three are in your third year of hero training, right? That's so cool. What are your quirks, and what kind of support items do you use? The big three idly wondered if they should introduce Melissa to Midoriya or keep them from ever meeting. They were too alike in their enthusiasm for heroes. They answered her questions as best they could, and then the topics drifted from hero-related things to regular school life to the mundane. How do you get your hair so straight? Melissa asked Kado. Mine is always wavy, no matter what I do. Brushing for hours on end, for one thing, Amajiki muttered. Hado heard him and stuck her tongue out, but before she could say anything, they felt a sharp tremor in the ground. Ahead of them, in what looked like an arena, a massive glacier rose up, freezing half the structure. That reminds me, Tagata said to Melissa. Some of our juniors from UA came here for the expo, and I think we just found them. They hurried over to the arena and arrived in time to see Todoroki melting off the thin layer of frost that covered his right side. Most of the audience was cheering for his performance, but his friends made the most noise. That was great, Shoto. Ashido called out and waved as he walked closer. Todoroki waved half-heartedly back with a little smile for her. Aw, that's so cute, Yuraraka teased, and Ashido's pink face went purple. How long are you gonna do that? She whined. How long did you tease me and Deku? Yuraraka asked back. You all look like you're having fun, Tagata cut in his head poking out through the bleachers. His sudden arrival made all of them younger students and several nearby adults jump in surprise. Hello, Mirio. Ida recovered first and bowed. It is good to see that you arrived safely. Where are Tamaki and Nejire? Tagata's arm passed through the seat and then curved to point down. Right here. Are you guys fighting robots? Cool. Asui nodded. Izuku, you're up next, Ribbit. Oh, right. Midoriya smiled at two of the adults who, now that Tagata paid attention, looked too similar to him to not be related and then waved at the big three. I'll be back in a minute. Siro laughed. Yeah, Shoto finished his round in seven seconds. Anyone think Izuku will do better? Yuraraka grinned and held up her hand. Tagata smiled back and gave her a high five while taking care not to touch all of her fingers as he pulled himself all the way into a seat. Amajiki and Nejire flew up to join them, the latter carrying Melissa. Eiyurazu immediately looked embarrassed. Oh, I'm sorry. We didn't know you had someone else with you. Melissa just smiled. It's fine. You all looked like you were having fun, and I didn't want to cut in. Ashido put an arm around the older girl's shoulders. Hey, the more the merrier. Come on, I'll introduce you to everyone while we wait for Midori. Quick introductions were made, including Midoriya's parents and apparently, this had been the first time Izuku had seen his father in over two years, which was news to Tagata before there was a sharp note of feedback on the speakers. Up next, another first-year student from UA High, it's Izuku Midoriya. Tagata had to remember that I Island did most things in English, which was why they introduced Midoriya's name differently. But he set that aside to watch with interest as the younger boy walked into the arena. I like the ears on his hood, Melissa commented which immediately set off laughter from almost everyone else. What? Before anyone could explain, a buzzer sounded, and robots began to climb out of hatches scattered across the arena, which had several different types of terrain packed together. The robots themselves were of several designs, ranging from thin and gangly to squat and armored. In a flash of green light, Midoriya transformed into Lodestar and held up his pincer-like hands. There was a ripple in the air as he unleashed his magnetic powers, and then the robots all started to rise. A moment later, all the screws and bolts holding them together popped out, and they fell to the ground in pieces. Amazing. The announcer said. That was four seconds. A new record. Midoriya turned back to normal and waved shyly at the roaring crowd. More than a few probably recognized him from watching the sports festival. But he hadn't used Lodestar then, so it was a treat for everyone. Nice job, Deku-kun, Yuraraka said as he rejoined them, and gave him a quick kiss on the cheek. Th thanks, Midoriya said through his blush. Melissa gently poked Tagata to get his attention. That is so cute. Are those two an item? Tagata grinned like a proud older brother. Oh, yeah, they just didn't know it until a little while ago. That's adorable. Welcome to the club, Ashido said. Its members include 99% of the planet. Melissa laughed, and then waved at Midoriya. Hi, there. And Melissa shield. How are you liking the island so far? And that watch of yours is so cool. It's a support item to help you use your quirk, right? 
who built it. It's great. As his young friend gave Melissa his cover story for the Ultimatrix, Tagata noticed that Midoriya had no problem switching to English, whereas everyone else took a second. He then remembered that the Ultimatrix also acted as a real-time translator. Wait, your name is Shield. Melissa's smile turned patient, as if she waiting for something. Uh huh, would you happen to be related to a David Shield? He's my father. Midoriya's jaw dropped, but everyone else looked confused. No way. He saw the looks everyone was giving him. David Shield was practically All Might's unofficial psychic during his stay in America. He also revolutionized support items and basically rebuilt the entire industry from the ground up. No one was surprised that Midoriya knew that, but they were surprised that they were sitting next to someone whose father was not only a big deal, but he was a big deal. Melissa's good cheer remained, but she sighed. Clearly, she was used to people fawning over her father's achievements. Yeah, he invented half the technology on the island, including what helps it move around. We basically own about a third of everything here. Asui blinked, and then turned to Yeyorazu. Ribbit, I think we finally met someone richer than you, Yeyamomo. Yeyorazu sniffed and pretended to be offended. I don't know about that. Who do you think owns one of the other thirds? Everyone shared a brief laugh, and then Melissa turned back to the arena. Hey, I think they're replacing the robots. After any of you go next, why don't I show you around before the preview? Midoriya shared a look with his friends and family, and then answered for all of them. Sure, between All Might and David Shield, it was impossible to tell who was more surprised when the former burst in on the ladder. For All Might, he was shocked at just how tired his friend looked. Even in his skinny form, at least he still looked like he slept. For David, it was because the person he wanted to see the most and least had suddenly showed up on his doorstep. Dave. All Might rushed in and grabbed his friend in a bear hug though not hard enough to break him. It's been too long, old buddy. David broke out of his shock and laughed. Toshi, it's good to see you. As befitting a man of his intelligence, it only took him a moment to figure out what was going on. Melissa asked you to come, didn't she? All Might put him down and laughed. Other than the tiredness, David hadn't changed at all since the last time he'd seen him. He was tall and thin, with short brown hair and a trim beard. His gray pants and blue shirt looked like they could use a good ironing, and his glasses only made the bags under his eyes worse. That she did, All Might said. She mentioned that you were working too hard, and I believe her. David grimaced. Yeah, I've been caught up in a new project for the last few weeks, and I, oh forgot to sleep for a while. I wish I could scold you for working too hard, but I'd be a hypocrite. All Might coughed into his hand, and David's eyes went wide when he saw blood. Toshi, what? Darn it, I was hoping that wouldn't happen for a while. All Might shrugged, and then reverted to his skinny form in a puff of steam. A surprise. David stared at him for a long moment. I think we need to have a talk. After about an hour of walking, Izuku's parents decided to go off on their own. They wanted their son to spend time with his friends, and he didn't need to see them kissing for hours on end. Not long after they left, Izuku decided to ask their guide a few questions. So, Melissa, are you a student here? Yeah, I'm in my third year of high school, she said. Families of active high-level employees can't actually travel, so they built a school here. I'm working to become a designer for support items, like my dad. With all the enthusiasm you've shown for heroes, I'm surprised you didn't try to become one yourself, Tagata said. Well, I still couldn't leave the island, even if I was a hero, Melissa replied. Besides, I'm actually quirkless. Midoriya was behind Melissa, so she didn't see him trip when he heard that. He hadn't met many other quirkless people before, and none of them had ever sounded so happy. Had she never been picked on or discriminated against because she didn't have any powers? Or maybe she had, but was too strong to let it bother her. Either way, he couldn't help but feel a little jealous. He would have given much just to have people stop harassing him as a child. Iraraka must have seen some of what he was feeling because she leaned into him and gave him a one-armed hug. He returned it, and reminded himself that he might have had a miserable past, but his present was full of light. Hey, can I ask something? Melissa stopped to let a man with a gigantification quirk cross the street in front of her. Do any of you have classes as UA with Uncle Might? He's one of the teachers for heroics, Ciro said. But only for first years, Ribbit, Asui added. I don't know if he actually has a teaching license. Huh? Melissa turned to the big three. How come you arrived with him, then? Aren't you third years? That was something the rising stars had been wondering, but never had the chance to ask. Well, actually, Tagata shrugged. All Might kind of took me under his wing. The strength and speed parts of my quirk are like his, so he decided to make me his protege. He wanted to take me to I Island, and I convinced him to take Tamaki and Nejire. That was believable enough for Melissa. Tagata had gone around in the arena, and everyone had gotten a good look at his power. 
he had almost matched Midoriya's time, but was slower by just half a second. Speaking of All Might, I think he's still scared of you, Achako, Ashido teased. Melissa frowned in confusion as she turned to Yuraraka. Why is? Yuraraka's smile was a little scary as she pulled Midoriya closer to her. He broke my boyfriend's jaw last week. I it was during a tea test, and it W was an accident. Midoriya protested. They're protective of each other, Todoroki said blandly. It's cute. The couple sputtered and went red-faced, and everyone else laughed. There was no laughter in David's lap. In fact, the man was as far from laughing as he could get. Toshi, how did this happen? He demanded as he looked over All Might's chart. How are your quirk levels going down? All Might stepped out of the medical pod David had used to check him and put his costume back on. I picked a fight with a villain that was a little too much for me. You can probably tell that my organs are pretty messed up. Transplants wouldn't take, and no one could help me. That doesn't explain why your quirk is weaker, just why you can't maintain it for as long. David sank in his chair and rubbed a hand over his face. How many people know about this? Not many. All Might sat in another chair. I've already made arrangements. There will be another symbol of peace once I'm forced to retire. David shook his head. Who could replace you, Tashinori? You're the reason crime is down to 6% in Japan. Most other countries are lucky if their crime levels are down to 20%. Heroes in other countries just can't do what you do. That wasn't fair to other nations or their heroes, All Might knew. Those percentages were also a little misleading. Technically, they only represented villain activity, not crime in general. If Japan released the real numbers, its people would find that crime was about the same worldwide. As the symbol of peace in Japan, All Might had just driven the criminals into the shadows. It gave people hope and a sense of security, but the danger was still there. Don't worry, Dave, he said. The hero who will replace me will not only be stronger, but he'll be an even brighter symbol than I ever was. I'll take your word for it, Toshi. All Might stood up and switched to his muscle form. Like I said, don't worry about it, at least for tonight. Let's enjoy the preview and have a little fun. You can meet some of my students from UA. I know some of them who would love to pick your brain. David managed a weak smile. Sure thing, Toshi. I'll see you tonight. I just want to go over some numbers before I get a little rest. You do that, old pal. All Might gave him a dazzling smile. I think I'll do the same in my hotel room. Later, after his friend was gone, David pulled out his phone and stared at it. At first, when All Might had arrived, he had begun to reconsider his course of action. After all, Toshinori had seemed as vibrant and powerful as ever. Maybe his analysis of All Might's statistics over the last few years had been for nothing until he had transformed into that skinny husk of a man. Things were worse than he thought, if anything, his resolve to see this through was strengthened. He could have called things off with a single text message. Instead, he put the phone back in his pocket. Tashinori would never approve of this, and neither would Melissa, but that was why it had to go perfectly. That way, no one would ever know the truth. I just have to get through tonight, he whispered. Then, I can finally rest. That evening, the girls of the Rising Stars were all in Yeyurazu's room, getting ready for the preview. Three of them were obviously excited, but Yuraraka's reluctance took them by surprise. While the others were putting on their dresses, she had been standing awkwardly in the corner. Achako, what's the matter? Ashido asked. I thought you were looking forward to this. Melissa even said there would be dancing later on. You told Midori to save a dance for you. Yeah, it's just Yuraraka grimaced and held up her formal wear. This is all I could afford. Asui studied it. Did you use parts of your school uniform, Ribbit? Yuraraka nodded, shamefaced. Everything I own is casual or practical. I never went to anything fancy, so. Yeyurazu walked up to her and gave her a quick hug. How about I make something for you? Ah, really? Yuraraka's eyes glistened with unshed tears, and it broke her friend's hearts. Absolutely, and we won't say anything if you don't want us to. Yeyurazu created a measuring tape and held it up to Yuraraka. Just let me get your measurements, and I'll make you something amazing. The preview was held in the central tower of the island. It was a massive structure, which could be seen from any other location. Not only did it hold the main attractions for the expo, it also housed everything necessary for administration over the island itself, and as the location for the preview, it was decorated with colorful lights and banners. Izuku swallowed nervously as he and his parents entered the building. He was wearing green suit pants and a jacket, with a pale yellow shirt and a red tie. His father wore something similar. But he had foregone the tie, he wore one almost every day for work, so he took every opportunity to not have one if he could help it. Inko had a beautiful sky blue dress, with a white sash around her waist, which fluttered in the night breeze. Hey, kiddo, I think I see one of your friends, Hisashi said, gesturing with his chin towards the stairs leading to the second story. 
We'll save you guys a good spot, okay? Are you sure, Dad? Inko smiled at her son. Don't worry, sweetie, go have fun with your friends. Izuku nodded, and then headed off, leaving his parents alone. Isashi leaned in and stole a quick kiss from Inko. I hope you'll save a dance for me, he said. Inko smiled up at him. Who else would I dance with? Ah, Izuku. Ida jogged over to meet Midoriya halfway. You were almost late. You should know to be punctual to events such as this. Ida's dark blue suit was immaculate, as expected. Midoriya wouldn't have been surprised if he had ironed it only a few minutes before arriving here. As sorry, Midoriya said. My parents wanted to take the scenic route. Ida continued to chop at the air, but before he could lecture further, Siro walked up behind him and put a hand on his shoulder. Siro's own suit was a dark gray, with a blue shirt and white tie. Dude, chill, it's a party. Midoriya was thankful for the distraction. Nobody liked it when Ida made a scene, especially when it was about them. Hey, Shoto. The other boy nodded as he adjusted his tie. His suit was a lighter gray than Siro's, with a silver shirt. He also looked slightly uncomfortable which Midoriya understood, he could count the times he'd needed formal wear on one hand. Where are the girls? Todoroki asked. We might get stuck behind the crowds. Siro chuckled. I don't think they'll take that long to get ready. Besides, the preview doesn't start for another half an hour. And my parents said they'd find a good spot for us, Midoriya added. Hey, guys. Ashido's voice made them turn. Were you waiting for us? How sweet. The boys didn't immediately respond. They were teenagers, and four pretty girls in pretty outfits had just showed up, so they were a little distracted. Ashido wore a form-fitting bright green dress that hung from one shoulder and had a long slit up the opposite side. Yeyurazu wore a more modest champagne-colored dress, but it was still elegant. She also had a beautiful necklace. Asui's yellow dress wasn't extravagant, but it was still pretty. Her only sign of nerves was that she kept smoothing it out. The pattern of Yuraraka's outfit reminded Midoriya of her costume. It was a mix of pink and white instead of black, with exposed shoulders and black stockings. She also had a pink choker and a flower in her hair, which she kept playing with as she walked up to her boyfriend. H. Hi, Deku-kun, she said shyly. You look really handsome. Midoriya just stared at her. His mouth moved, but no words came out. I think you broke him, Ribbit. Asui glanced at the other boys. Actually, I think they're all broken. Ashido grinned and walked up to Todoroki. She put her hands on his shoulders and leaned in close. Like what you see, Shoto. For possibly the first time in his life, Todoroki actually looked flustered. I, ha. Uh. Ashido outright cackled. I told you I'd get my revenge. Ida regained his composure first and bowed, though he remained red-faced. You all look amazing. Why, yeah. Midoriya nodded. You look be beautiful. The words might have been for all of them, but his eyes remained locked on Uraraka who blushed and gave him a quick peck on the cheek. Now all we need to do is figure out how to get Ben a suit, and we'll be ready for a party, Ashido said. Don't worry about me, Ben said as he appeared in front of them. I'm my own tailor. Siro blinked at him. Seriously, a freaking tux. Ben pretended to adjust his cuffs. The name's Ben Holo Ben. Too bad you have to stay hidden, Ribbit, Asui said. You kind of make it work. A martini appeared in Ben's hand, and he slowly swirled it in the glass. Yeah, I know. His eyes went wide, and then he vanished. Incoming. There you all are. Melissa, wearing a white skirt and low-cut blue top, hurried over to them. Her glasses were gone, and she'd tied back her hair. Mirio asked me to find you guys before the preview started. Where is he, anyway? Ciro asked. He's down there, with Uncle Might, she said, waving towards a large window, which they looked through. Sure enough, they saw him next to All Might. Unlike the younger students, he was in costume. I'm not sure about Tamaki and Nejire, though. They kind of wandered off. Will they be in trouble? Yeyurazu asked, slightly worried. Melissa smiled. It'll be fine. If they go somewhere they shouldn't, one of the security robots will point them in the right direction. How come Mirio gets to be in costume? Siro looked a little disgruntled. It'll be so easy for him to make connections that way. People will have to ask what we're even doing here. Ashido grinned. Hey, how often will we get a chance to look this good? Enjoy the moment. I have to say, young Mirio, you're handling this better than I did at your age. All Might said under his breath as he smiled at the small crowd waiting for the preview to start. His successor grinned at him. Honestly, this is all pretty intimidating. A lot of these people have such high expectations just because I'm standing next to you. It's gonna get a lot worse when you make the big announcement. Sadly, that's the price of being the symbol of peace. All Might paused to snag an appetizer that looked ridiculously small in his big hands. Everyone expects you to be Atlas to hold the world on your shoulders and never shrug. 
to God to look thoughtful at that. No offense, all might, but that sounds almost impossible and kind of lonely since Atlas hardly ever even spoke to anyone while he held up the world. All Might blinked, surprised at Tagata's interpretation of his metaphor. He wasn't wrong, though. All Might could count the number of people he completely trusted, to get to know the real him, on his hands, and still have fingers left over. For all that his fans would swarm him if he so much as stepped outside in his muscle form, he never really gave himself time for a social life. Tagata was right. It was lonely as the pillar that held up society, but All Might didn't see any other option. Then again, maybe Tagata would find a path that better suited him as the future top hero of Japan. Then he saw David, wearing a neatly pressed suit, waving him towards the stage, and he pushed those thoughts aside for later. Now, he had to give a brief speech to the guests, but he nearly froze when he caught sight of a particular couple. He wouldn't have given them a second thought, but the man looked like a much taller version of Midoriya, and the woman had the boy's eyes. Thanks to Tagata, he'd known that Midoriya was coming to I Island, but he'd apparently brought his parents along. Years of maintaining a facade allowed him to keep walking without breaking out in a cold sweat. But All Might sincerely hoped that Midoriya's parents didn't know that he'd broken their son's jaw recently. Dang it, the speech is starting. Siro pointed to the crowd below. We're gonna miss it. Um, guys. Ashido pointed at the doorway behind them, now blocked by a thick sheet of metal. I think the door is locked. Melissa frowned. That shouldn't happen. The only reason the doors would lock is in preparation for a lockdown or at closing hours, but there's supposed to be an announcement before that. Ashido tried pulling at the thin seam in the middle of the door, but it didn't budge. Well, maybe there's a glitch. No, there are too many backups for that to happen. Melissa bit her lip as she thought. There's something else going on. Hello, everyone. All Might said as he reached the microphone. It's great to be here. Maybe it's my imagination. But I Island is even more incredible than the last time I was here. Then again, the steam engine was a new invention back then. A few people laughed at his joke about his age which was better than normal, since his jokes tended to be among the dad variety. And since I'm so old, I thought I'd ask a younger, up-and-coming hero to help me get around. All Might continued and waved up to Gata. He may still be a student at my alma mater, but I promise, the whole world will know how amazing he is soon enough. Give it up for Lemillion. The crowd applauded as Tagata made his way to the stage. Some of the applause was just polite, but All Might's enthusiasm had a few people clapping their hands with more vigor. To All Might's disappointment, David was among the former, then again, he probably just needed time to accept that All Might even needed a successor. He knew for a fact that most people in Japan would be the same. Tagata smiled, as confident as ever, though All Might was positive the boy was nervous. He was just good at hiding it behind a smile. Hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. Tagata would have said more, but he noticed that the many television screens in the room had changed. Instead of showing generic images of the island, the screens had turned red, with warning flashing across. Everyone, hero and civilian alike, had less than two seconds to wonder what was going on, and then the island's security system turned against them. Nozzles appeared under the feet of every hero, and spat out what looked like strands of glowing blue tape. The material, created by David Shield himself as a capture tool, was normally as soft as silk, but when electrically charged, it became a hundred times stronger than steel. Of the heroes, only All Might and Tagata remained free. The former was able to dodge it with his superhuman reflexes and speed, while the other simply let the tape pass harmlessly through him. The only two free heroes readied themselves for battle as the doors opened, and armed gunmen charged in. They wore stylized military uniforms, and their faces were concealed by black ski masks, decorated with a white X across the front. I'd settle down, if I were you, another man said as he followed behind his men. He wore a similar uniform to the others, but with a long white coat and a mask that looked like it was made of twisted strips of metal, and his mouth had a semi-transparent cloth over it. In one hand, he carried a pistol, which he casually aimed at a frightened civilian. A civilian, All Might realized, who was also Midoriya's mother. Just so you know, the man said conversationally, we've already taken over the island's security systems, and have deployed its robots everywhere. Right now, innocent people all over are being escorted to a safe location. But if you try anything, those robots are going to suddenly see those people as enemy combatants. I imagine that thousands of people will die before you manage to get the situation under control. Sure enough, the television screens showed shots of the stubby Eye Island robots hurting groups of frightened civilians. The unknowing hostages numbered in the hundreds, probably even more. What do you want, villain? All Might growled, unable to maintain his smile in the face of such cowardly tactics. You can call me Wolfram. 
As for what I want, nothing from you, other than to stay still and let yourself be tied up for a while. The two men locked eyes for what seemed like an eternity, until All Might finally nodded and stood down. Tagata reluctantly followed suit, and they were soon captured. Now, who here has high enough clearance to get to the vault? So that's what this is about, All Might thought. This is a robbery. They're after the security vault, where the scientists keep all their most advanced inventions. Wolfram strode through the crowd, looking each civilian in the eyes, as if searching for something. Finally, a portly, middle-aged man in an expensive suit flinched, and Wolfram grinned. I'm guessing you have that kind of clearance. Leave him alone. David stepped in front of the other man. Sam is my assistant, I'm the one you want. Wolfram sneered. Even better, we'll take you both. It was hard to tell who struggled harder Midoriya or Melissa. The latter was held back by Yeyarazu and Ashido, and Siro was forced to put tape over her mouth to keep her from screaming. Midoriya had to practically be wrestled to the floor by Todoroki and Ida, and Yuraka kept a close eye on the Ultimatrix, in case he tried to go for it. Their reactions were understandable. After all, the same man who had just kidnapped Melissa's father had also pointed a gun at Midoriya's mother. Let me go. Midoriya snapped. I have to help them. Izuku, calm down. Yuraka forced him to look at her. There are guys with guns down there. If someone tries something, someone could get shot. That's why All Might and Mirio didn't fight. Her words got through to both Midoriya and Melissa, and they stopped struggling. Midoriya leaned against the far wall arms hugging his legs to his chest. After Melissa peeled the tape off her mouth, she did the same next to him. We should call the authorities, Ida said. And sure there are more heroes on the island who could help. Todoroki pulled out his phone, but shook his head. No service. I bet the villains thought someone might do this and took precautions. Melissa wiped her eyes with a trembling hand. If if they have control over the security systems, then they could shut off all internal communications. Actually, they could basically control the entire island. Yeyurazu bit her lip. Is there anything that could be done? Maybe. Melissa shrugged helplessly. Everything is controlled from the security center at the top floor, but it could be switched back. Midoriya froze, and then slowly turned to her. Could you fix this? I mean, yes. I'd have to get into the security center, though. And the villains have someone there already, and probably more between here and there, Midoriya finished, and then looked at his friends. We have to do something. Izuku, are you suggesting that we fight these villains ourselves? Ida crossed his arms, as serious as anyone had ever seen him. We don't have licenses, and this is extremely dangerous. And we have no idea what these guys will do if we don't act, Midoriya argued. Instead of letting the hostages go after they get what they want, they could his voice shook and he glanced in the direction of his parents. They could kill the hostages, so there aren't witnesses. He's right, Todoroki said. Right now, we're the only ones in the building who can do anything. But all we have to do is free the heroes, Midoriya went on. Once that's done, they can do the rest. We can try to get this done with as little fighting as possible. See, Midori has a plan. Ashido tried to look as upbeat as possible. I'm in. So am I, Yuraraka said. Me too, Siro added. Ribbit. Siro chuckled. I'll take that as a yes. We can do this, Tenya, Yayorazu said. Like Izuku said, we just need to restore the security, and the heroes can do the rest. Ida frowned, but eventually nodded. Very well, I will go along with this, on the condition that we retreat if things become too dangerous. Everyone agreed, if they drew too much attention to themselves, it could endanger the hostages. Midoriya turned to Melissa. Are you in? The girl nodded, expression fierce. This will help save my father. Of course I'm in. We still have one problem, Ribbit, Asui said. The heroes could be just as surprised if they're suddenly free. They need to know if it's safe to fight. I could turn into Ghost Freak, Midoriya offered, already activating the Ultimatrix. I can whisper to Mirio and All Might. Wait. Yeyurazu grabbed his hand before he touched the dial. The villains could see the light when you transform. Maybe you should move away from the window. Oh, right. Midoriya was a little embarrassed. He had never considered that someone could be alerted before he even did anything. After moving down the hallway, he turned into Ghost Freak and phased through the floor. I'll be right back. Look for a new angle. Never stop searching for the most optimal solution to a problem. Always try to gain every advantage over an opponent. Those were three of Sir Night Eye's lessons that stuck with Tagata more than others. Even though he didn't dare use his quirk to escape his bonds, he still looked around as much as possible. He took mental notes of each guard, estimating how fast he could incapacitate them before they could endanger a life. Unfortunately, they were spread too far he was positive he could defeat six of them in time. But after that, shots would get fired and someone could die. What we need is for both All Might and I to get free, 
he thought, even in his weakened state. And even though I can only safely use 30% of my power right now, we'd be more than fast enough to stop all of these guys. All of the ones in that room, of course, there was nothing any of them could do about the thousands of people across the island, unless the entire security system was fixed. That was another problem Tagata was smart, but he wouldn't know the first thing about reprogramming a state-of-the-art security system. Psst, Mirio, an unfamiliar voice whispered in his ear. It's me, Izuku. I turned into Ghost Freak, so I'm invisible. Tagata was about to speak, but an invisible hand covered his mouth. No, just listen. The rest of us are upstairs. With Melissa, she says she can fix the security to save everyone, so we're going to get her to the top floor. All Might was close enough to hear him, but had enough self-control to stay quiet. He did, however, shake his head, trying to get Midoriya to abandon the plan. Unfortunately, Tagata didn't see any other solution. You guys need to be ready to move to save the people here as soon as we fix things, Midoriya went on. Just keep my parents safe, please. Tagata glanced back at Midoriya's parents. Inko was trembling in Hisashi's arms, and both of them were frantically looking about for their son. Tagata nodded, and he felt the hand on his mouth relax. Thanks, he said, already fading away. We'll get you free as soon as possible. Tagata took a deep breath to center himself. Good luck, he whispered. This oh. Ashido stumbled as they climbed yet another flight of stairs. This isn't working, guys. Midoriya looked back. He and the other boys had noticed that the girls had fallen back a good distance by now. What's wrong? Yuraka grimaced and pulled off her shoes. We're all wearing heels. Deku-kun, they're not exactly built for running. Yeyurazu took off her own shoes and looked at them mournfully. And I bought these just for tonight she put them on the floor, next to the other girl's shoes. We'll have to remember where we put these. Of the girls, only Asui looked more relaxed. Ribbit, now I can jump, Hanta and I can scout ahead, if that's okay. Don't go too far, Todoroki advised. We don't want to get separated, especially since we have so much farther to go. Melissa, bringing up the rear, panted and glared at the sign that read level 25. After this is over I'm telling Papa to install an elevator that runs independent of the security system. Midoriya shared a guilty look with his friends. They were all in very good shape, and so was Melissa, but she clearly wasn't used to this kind of exertion. Do you want me to make you float? Yuraka offered. One of us could drag you, and you could get a little rest. Melissa shook her head. No, it's fine. Save your quirk for when you need it. It was when they finally reached the 30th floor that they encountered their first real obstacle. An automated emergency door began to slide shut, blocking their path to the next stairway. The villains must have noticed them on the cameras and were moving to contain them. The students' training and instincts took over. Todoroki kept the door from closing completely by wedging it open with ice, and then Ida vaulted through the open space to knock down the next door with a recipro-assisted kick. Smaller doors closed every so often and Ashido and Midoriya took turns breaking through. The former would melt them down with her acid, and the latter shattered them as forearms. We're going to have to enter the main section of the tower soon, Melissa said when they took a few minutes to rest. After the 80th floor, I mean, they already know we're in the building, so the security systems are going to try to stop us no matter where we are. Ashida wiped off a few small globs of acid from her hands. Well that kinda sucks. We'll have one advantage, Midoriya muttered, half to himself. If we're not using the emergency stairs the whole time, we should have more room to maneuver and hopefully avoid any major fighting. Yuraka rubbed her sore feet. More running. Day. She and the other girls smiled in relief when Todoroki created a few chunks of ice for them. Thanks, Shoto. Todoroki shrugged and looked up at the next door. We need to move. Hurry up. Ashido rolled her eyes. Okay, are you a gentleman or a stoic jerk? Both are attractive, but pick one. Can you flirt later, please? Siro asked as he helped Asui to her feet. Time and place, Mina. There is always time for flirting, Ashido replied, but did go quiet as they finally risked going out into the open when they reached the 80th floor. The floor itself looked very out of place for such a technologically advanced structure. It reminded Midoriya of a public garden, or an enormous greenhouse, with plants from all over the world. This floor was built to test how certain quirks affected plants, Melissa answered, in response to his unasked question. She then pointed to the other side of the room. We'll have to take the service ladder to the gantry above us and then take another emergency staircase. After that, it's all security stations and administration. I know the shortest route to the security control room. How much free time do you have for you to know all this stuff? Ciro asked. Melissa made a noise that sounded like a cross between a cough and a laugh. I have nothing to do on this island except study, work on support items, and explore. 
I have all the free time. Hey, what about that elevator? Yurok pointed to the huge pillar at the center of the room. Couldn't that take us straight to the top? No, we'd need special clearance for that elevator, and it's monitored. Melissa sighed. There are a dozen failsafes built in to keep someone from hijacking it including explosives as a last resort. So much for using Lodestar to lift us all up there, Midoriya muttered. Wait a second. Yayurazu stared at the elevator. I think someone is coming down. They were too far away from the service ladder. They wouldn't make it before whoever was in the elevator arrived. Instead, they darted for the nearest bushes and hid. Their best bet to avoid a fight was to hope that any villains just kept on walking. Two men emerged from the elevator they wore the same uniforms as the other villains, but other than that, they were as different as night and day. One was short and broad, with an expression that suggested he had the intelligence of a particularly thick rock, while the other was tall, almost unhealthily skinny, and had a face that was distinctly rodent-like. Midoriya prayed that they didn't know where he and his friends were, but his hand hovered over the Ultimatrix. Beside him, his friends were tense, none of them were sure whether they would fight or run. Aside from Melissa, all of them had fought villains at some point, but those times had happened too fast for them to really think about what was going on. They'd been climbing stairs for almost an hour now, and that had given them all time to really think about what they were doing, and the consequences if they failed. Hey, we see you, the skinny villain shouted. Get out here, we've been made, Ben said, though only Midoriya could hear him. You're going to have to move fast. You've got three seconds to come out, or we don't take any chances, the shorter villain said. The students flinched when they heard the sound of a gun being cocked. Get ready to move, Todoroki murmured. They'll block them. Hands raised, they stepped out of the bushes. Midoriya swallowed nervously when he found himself staring down the barrel of the gun in the shorter villain's hand. It was one thing to face danger as an alien that could shrug off a bullet, but it was another thing entirely when he was a vulnerable human. He was reminded of the USJ attack, when Shigaraki was inches away from destroying him, and he started to tremble. Aw, you kids thought you'd play hero, huh? The skinny villain mocked. They really should have stayed put, huh, Dago? You said it, Nabu, the shorter one, Dago, said. He sneered, and was about to pull the trigger when two things happened at once. First, a wall of ice rushed up to block his shot. It turned out to be unnecessary, because a long tentacle grabbed Dago's arm and forced the gun up. Both Dago and Nabu were blasted away from the students by a spiral wave of energy. Uraraka's eyes went wide. Nejire, Tomaki, hi, guys. Nejire Chan called out as she flew over to them. Looks like we got here just in time. They're getting back up, Sun Eater said as he joined her, his voice unusually steady. What's going on here? We don't have time to explain the details, Yeyurazu said quickly. The short version is that villains have taken over the security systems. We need to get Melissa there so that she can free all the hostages and the heroes can handle the rest. It spoke of the older students' experience and capability that they didn't hesitate. They turned to face Dago and Nabu, who looked more than ready to fight. You guys go on ahead, Sun Eater ordered. We'll take care of these guys, and then we'll catch up. Midoriya knew that they had no time to discuss it. Be careful. Rather than keep going for the service ladder, Todoroki created an erupting column of ice underneath their feet that lifted them to the gantry above. Melissa led the way to the next part of the tower, but Midoriya couldn't help looking back at the fight breaking out below. Both Dago and Nabu had activated their quirks. The latter's hands had become larger and webbed, while the former's entire body had become larger, bulging with muscle, and he'd turned purple. The last thing Midoriya saw before he turned a corner was the two villains charging at his friends. Okay, now we have a new problem, Melissa said as they reached the next section. Oh, what now? Ashido whined. Melissa gestured to the door. This one is locked from the other side, and if we try to just knock it down, it'll trigger automated defenses, like electrified floors and knockout gas. Yeyurazu frowned. Why haven't they tried to use that on us before? Hey, I'm not complaining, Ciro half joked. It's part of a layered security network, Melissa explained. The most sensitive areas of the tower are above us, so the defenses are tightest. And they exist on a separate, isolated network, to keep a cyber attack from taking over the whole thing. That makes sense, Yeyurazu said. Ashido leaned over to whisper to Yuraraka. It does. Yuraraka shrugged. Smart people techno babble. Ah, uh, all we have to do is unlock the door from the other side, Melissa said. There's a small service duct that leads around, but someone would have to go outside the tower itself. Midoriya held up one hand. Um I could just walk through the door and unlock it. Melissa blinked. Or you could do that. Midoriya cycled through his aliens until he found the one he needed. When the flash of light faded, everyone saw that he had turned into a blue insect-like creature that seemed to be wearing a blue cloak and hood. That one is new, Ida noted. 
What do you call it? Big Chill, the Mothman said. Give me a minute, and I'll have that door open. A moment later, Big Chill's body became transparent, and he simply walked through the door. There was a loud clunk, and then a squeak as the door opened. And you didn't get electrified, Ribbit. Asui hesitated, and then hopped through the open doorway. Anything else we need to worry about? We got past those villains, Melissa said, so I think they're going to try harder to stop us. Sun Eater grunted with effort as Dago slammed his fist into the clamshell he'd manifested. The shell cracked from the impact, but it still held. Sun Eater wrapped the tentacles on his other hand around Dago's torso and hurled him across the room. The big man skidded and rolled, then recovered and charged again. The other half of the fight wasn't going anywhere either. Nejire Chan bombarded Nabu with spiral waves, but every time the energy was about to hit him, a chunk of it suddenly vanished and reappeared elsewhere, opening up a hole just big enough for Nabu to slide through. It seemed that his quirk involved displacing whatever was in a certain space, including energy. Sun Eater didn't want to think about what could happen if he hit a living person with that quirk. Sun Eater was worried not just about the fighting here, but for the younger students and Melissa, for Tagata and All Might, and for all the people in danger. And he was worried about Nejire Chan. She was using a lot of energy in a very short amount of time, and if the fight didn't end quickly, she ran the very real risk of permanently damaging her health. He couldn't bear the thought of that happening. Pay attention. Dago roared, and only a last second dodge prevented Sun Eater from getting his skull crushed. You think we're just small time crooks, so you won't take this seriously. He grinned. Maybe that pretty girl will be more of a challenge. Nabu. Nabu glanced at his partner and nodded. A moment later, he displaced a chunk of the floor over to Dago, who hurled it with the speed of a baseball pitcher directly at Nejire Chan. She saw the attack coming and blasted the debris. But it was too late, a piece of concrete clipped the side of her head, and she tumbled out of the air. So much for that one, Dago sneered, only to get sent flying back as a clamshell hand smashed into his face. Get away from her, Sun Eater shouted, and put himself between Nejire Chan and the villains. Tamaki Nejire Chan tried to stand, but all she managed was to sit up. Her hand went to her head and came away bloody. Stay there, Sun Eater said, his voice so full of resolve that even the villains were taken aback. I'll end this in a second. Nabu glared at him. You really are arrogant, aren't you? No, I'm not. Sun Eater reached up and removed his visor. I just know I can beat a couple of thugs like you. You can barely stop my punches. Dago roared as he charged again. What makes you think you can beat us? Simple, Sun Eater thought. I just need to stop holding back. Remember what I've learned at UA combining manifestations, choosing the right characteristics and stop being afraid. Dago was slammed into the floor with incredible force by what seemed to be a larger tentacle at first. However, that tentacle, and the dozen others that replaced Sun Eater's arms, was covered in segments of red shell. His face was also covered by the same living armor, shaped to look like a mask that concealed all but his eyes. Vast hybrid, he shouted, Chimera Kraken. The enormous tentacles moved in a blur. Dago tried to rise to his feet, only to get them swept out from under him. He had just fallen on his back when a pair of tentacles slammed down on him over and over, beating him like a drum, until the middle sections of both tentacles abruptly vanished, and then reappeared a short distance away. Blood spewed from the stumps of his limbs and Sun Eater flinched from the pain, and then glared at Nabu. He sent four tentacles at the thinner villain, but three of them were displaced into several pieces, scattered all over. The fourth tentacle managed to catch Nabu in the chest with enough force to drive the air from his lungs. With a little bit of effort, Sun Eater replaced his damaged tentacles with new ones, which he used to grab Dago's limbs. He heaved the purple ogre over his head and slammed him into the down Nabu. There was a crash and a cloud of dust, and when it settled, the two villains were done, their transformations had reverted, and they were clearly unconscious. Sun Eater remained ready, just in case, for several seconds. Once he was sure that his opponents weren't getting back up, he let his manifestations fade. His arms were sore, and some of the damage Nabu had done had transferred over, but it wasn't too serious. Are you okay, Nejire? He asked. For a moment, he wondered if she was concussed because she just stared up at him, as if trying to comprehend what she was seeing. Sun Eater hesitated, and then held out one hand, which she took. I'm okay, Tamaki, she finally said. That was amazing. Sun Eater looked away, embarrassed. It's nothing. Mirio would have done so much better. Because he wasn't looking at her, he didn't realize she was leaning in for a kiss until her lips pressed against his cheek. Now it was his turn to stare, and she smiled. He didn't shine like you did just now. Sun Eater felt tears prick at the corner of his eyes. Nejire Chan tugged at his arm, and even with blood covering half of her face, her smile was as bright as the sun. Come on, 
We should catch up with the others. All right. As he followed after her, Sun Eater smiled. She said I shined if she really believes that. Maybe it's true. We're near a lot of the administrative systems now, Melissa said as they ran. Most of the rooms are filled with computers and sensitive equipment. Then we'll have to be careful not to damage anything, Ida said. This is all critical for maintaining the island. Ashido rolled her eyes. I can feel you glaring at me, Tenya. I know, I know, be careful with the acid. Where's the next staircase, Ribbit? Asui asked, cutting off a potential argument. Just up ahead, Melissa said. It's a generator room. Ashido melted the door up ahead, but jumped back as soon as she saw what was on the other side. Oh, guys, there's a bunch of robots waiting for us. Is there any other way through? Ida asked Melissa. It would be better if we could avoid a fight. Melissa shook her head. Every other route would take too long. Then we have to get through those robots, Ciro said. I can clear a path, Midoriya offered. Cannonbolt could just run over them. You should hurry up, Ribbit, Asui said. I think they're coming. All right. Midoriya transformed into Cannonbolt and walked over to the doorway. Th that's a lot of robots. At first glance, the I Island robots weren't that intimidating, but that was probably the point. They were vaguely conical, but with a blunt top and rolled around on four stubby wheeled legs. During the few short breaks they'd taken, Melissa had told them all about what she knew of the robots' capabilities. They weren't designed to really hurt someone, but they were durable, and enough of them could immobilize almost anyone with strong cables they could launch. Their downside was that they weren't very fast, so all the students had to do was get past them and make it to another floor. Cannonbolt curled up and started rolling in place to build up speed. But the robots were nearly on him already, and if he didn't move soon, they'd get past the narrow walkway that funneled them into one place. At that moment, he had a crazy idea, and without time to think it through, he decided to go for it. Tenya, kick me, he shouted. Ida hesitated for half a second, but he trusted Midoriya, and he wouldn't have asked for such a crazy thing if he didn't think it would work. Everyone stepped aside as Ida's boosters flared, and he launched himself forward. Recipro burst. His leg connected solidly with Cannonbolt, who began rolling forward just before impact. The result was that Cannonbolt rocketed through the robots so quickly that many of them were shattered into pieces. Cannonbolt himself was lodged in the far wall and couldn't get free. Um, a little help. He called. Uraraka made him weightless, and then Siro and Asui pulled him free. After Uraraka returned the effects of gravity, Midoriya turned back to normal. That was so cool, you too, Ashido said to Midoriya and Ida. You should remember that move. Despite the situation, Ida couldn't help but smile. Indeed. Though, perhaps we should make sure you don't get stuck in a wall, Izuku. Why yeah? Midoriya tried and failed not to look embarrassed, especially when the girls giggled for a moment. He shot Yuraka a betrayed look, but she barely tried to hide how funny she found him. See come on, we need to keep going. There were no more robot attacks until they reached the server room, and even though each individual robot wasn't too much of a threat, the sight of dozens pouring out to attack them was a little worrying. We need to push past them, Todoroki said, his left hand wreathed in flame. No, wait. Melissa grabbed his shoulder. Remember, we can't damage the servers, or the whole island will fall into chaos. She's right, Yeyarazu said. Izuku, Mina, Shoto, take Melissa to the security center. The rest of us will make sure the villains don't damage the servers as a last resort. Are you sure? Midoriya asked. He trusted his friends, true but he didn't like the idea of leaving them behind. Don't worry, Deku-kun, Yuraraka said, not taking her eyes off the advancing robots. We'll be fine. Midoriya nodded one last time at his friends, and then he and the others followed Melissa through a side corridor. All right, everyone, Ida said, boosters glowing, let's go. Ribbit. Sui's tongue wrapped around a robot, and with a heave, she launched it into the air. As her tongue retracted, she jumped up and kicked another robot. The first robot was kicked into a wall by Siro as he swung around with his tape, and the second was stabbed by a sword Yeyarazu had made. Ida, boosters at full power, smashed through several more. Yuraraka made one robot weightless and then used it as an improvised club. When her weapon became too damaged, she tossed it aside and grabbed another. Cover me. Yeyarazu barked, and Siro made a net of tape to block the robot's path as Yeyarazu opened up her dress enough to create a cannon. I have enough lipids to make a few soft ammo shells. When she stumbled after making such a large object, Siro glanced back at her in worry, but immediately averted his gaze when he saw that Yeyarazu hadn't completely closed up her dress. Okay, as sure. Hanta, move. Asui tackled Siro out of the way, just before a robot's cables would have wrapped around him. 
Without another word, she twisted around and kicked that robot with enough strength to dent the metal and knock it over. Ciro kept it from getting back up with a few strands of tape. Thanks, Ciro panted. He was using so much of his tape that he was starting to get dehydrated, and he wasn't the only one suffering after tonight. Yeyarazu was able to create half a dozen of shells filled with a putty-like substance and fired at the robots before the effort made her fall to her knees. Ida got in a few more recipro-assisted kicks before his engine stalled out, and then he was barely able to do more than dent the robots. Sui, like Siro, wasn't made for this kind of fight, and after a few minutes, her legs were covered in bruises. Iraraka was the first to get caught. She had quickly worn herself out using her quirk over and over, and when she stumbled, a pair of robots tied her ankles together and pinned her arms to her sides. She fell to the ground heavily, and she saw stars. When her vision cleared, things had gone from bad to worse. Hida was pinned by a dozen robots, and needed his legs tied together several times over when he continued to kick his captors. Yeyarazu, barely able to move after using so many lipids, was dragged away by another robot. Asui was tied up from mouth to ankles, the robots had seen how dangerous her tongue could be, and weren't taking any chances. Poor Siro had each arm tied behind him, and forced face first into the floor. It was hard for Yuraraka to tell for sure, but she guessed they'd fought an endless tide of robots. Robots specifically meant to withstand combat with Quirk users, for about five minutes. I hope we bought them enough time. There it is. Melissa pointed to a thinner tower connected to the main one by a bridge that sat over a series of wind turbines. We just need to get in there and we can fix this. Oh, thank God, Ashido whined. I am never complaining about Aizawa Sensei's drills again after this. Midoriya had to agree. The climb here had been awful, and it wasn't getting any better, it was even colder at the top of the tower, and the wind felt like it was cutting into his skin. He would be happy to relax somewhere warm when this was over. Look out. Todoroki stopped and held out his arm to block their progress. More robots. Sure enough, robots were swarming across the bridge and from a door ahead of them in an effort to stop them. We don't have time to deal with them, Todoroki said and tossed away his jacket. Izuku, take Melissa to the security center and end all this. Vina and I will hold off the robots. Midoriya looked from one friend to another. Are you sure? Ashido smiled at him. Don't worry, Midori, up here, Shoto and I can cut loose. Okay, thanks. Midoriya turned into Jetray and presented his back to Melissa. Climb on, and hold on tight. Thanks, Melissa said, and wrapped her arms around his neck. Good luck, you two. Jetray quickly carried them both to the other side of the bridge, but Ishido only focused on them for a moment. You ready for this, Shoto? Todoroki's left arm ignited, burning away his sleeve. Let's go. A stream of fire washed over the first rank of robots. They were heat resistant, but only to a point, and when Todoroki focused, he exceeded their limit. Most of the first wave stuttered to a halt, their armor warped and glowing, while smoke coughed from overheated circuits. Ashido skated forward on a stream of acid, nimbly dodging the cables the robots tried to catch her with. She spun gracefully, arms out and spraying a much stronger acid. Again, the robots were built to resist damage, but only so far, and many of them were barely recognizable after only a few seconds. Todoroki wished he could just push all the robots off the edge of the tower with his ice. Unfortunately, there was a chance that the falling machines would hit someone on the ground, and that limited his options with his ice. So, you having fun yet? Ashido asked as she skated over to him. This is fun for you. Well, I'm cold. My feet hurt, and I'm trying not to think about how high up we are, Ashido admitted. But other than that, I'm having a blast. Todoroki impaled several robots with spikes of ice. It's not that cold. Dude, you're heat and cold proof, you don't get to talk. Ashido hurled a glob of acid like a grenade, and then ducked back behind Todoroki. This dress was not meant for cold and wind. In that moment, Todoroki was glad that he was busy fighting robots, because he almost turned to look at her. Strong wind and dresses did not mix, and a few stray droplets of acid dripped onto her dress every so often, making tiny holes. Ashido hissed and rubbed one arm. Ouch, I'm using stronger acid, and it's starting to hurt. Todoroki didn't want to admit it, but he was starting to get tired as well. He only needed a minute to even himself out with his quirk, but the robots weren't about to give him that time. Eventually, because he couldn't use as much ice, he would start to overheat, and he knew from Endeavor how bad that would be. I really wish we had some backup, he thought. As if the universe heard him, a spiral of energy shot overhead and crashed into the robots, blasting them apart. A moment later, enormous tentacles grabbed more robots and crushed them. You guys need some help, Nejire-chan asked as she and Sun Eater landed next to them. 
Yes, please. Ashido chirped. Sun Eater tossed aside more robots before glancing at them. Where's everyone else? Most of them are keeping the server room safe, Todoroki reported. Izuku took Melissa to the security center to end this. Cool. Mejire-chan gathered more energy in her hands. Then let's keep these things off their backs. Todoroki looked at Ishido and smirked. Okay, now I'm starting to have fun. Jetray landed just outside the door. And when Melissa got off, he turned into Diamond Head. Okay, I'll go in and make sure it's safe, and then you follow me. Got it. Melissa did her best to keep up a brave face. Good luck. Diamond Head knew he'd made the right call as soon as he walked through the door a man with metallic blades covering his arms lunged at him, swords scraping off Diamond Head's arm. You kids just don't know when to give up. No, not really. Diamond Head grabbed the man's wrists and then slammed his forehead into his nose. It took two more headbutts before Diamond Head was sure he was unconscious and then he let go. You can come in, he called out. Wow, Melissa said, gingerly stepping around the unconscious villain. Just how many quirks do you have? On the one hand, Diamond Head didn't want to call his aliens quirks anymore. Then again, this world had quirks because of the same alien DNA in the Ultimatrix. Um, I have a lot, he said vaguely. It's a good thing you have that watch to help you use all those powers. Melissa frowned. And it's a good thing you're here, Izuku. I don't think I would have made it far without a quirk. Don't sell yourself short, Diamond Head said. You might be quirkless, but you're braver than anyone I've ever met. And you seem to know everything we need to save everyone. So I'm sure you'd figure out a way to get here, even if you'd been alone. Melissa smiled. Thanks. I think the only person who ever said something like that to me was Papa. Everyone else just looks down on me because I'm quirkless, even if they don't say anything, because of my father. So, she does know what it's like, Diamond had thought. She and I are more alike than I thought. Well, let's go save him, so he can go back to telling you things like that. Smooth, buddy, Ben said. Seriously, if you weren't dating your Araka, I'd say you just intentionally earned serious points with this one. Diamond Head was glad he couldn't blush, but he still made sure not to look at Melissa as they climbed the last flight of stairs. A pair of gunmen met them halfway and opened fire, but Diamond Head created a barrier in front of Melissa and then charged forward. The bullets ricocheted harmlessly off of him, and when he got close enough, he beat both men into the ground. Okay, there's only the storage vault between us and the security center, Melissa said as she stepped over the downed criminals. Papa will be in either of those places. If he's in the vault, we can save him, and then he can help us save everyone else. Sounds good to me. Diamond had led the way into the vault a massive circular room, lined with containers built into the walls but what he and Melissa saw made them both freeze. David's shield wasn't being held at gunpoint, nor was he restrained in any way. In fact, he seemed to be almost casual as he chatted with the villain who had taken him prisoner. Papa, David turned, and his eyes went wide with horror as he saw his daughter. Melissa, what are you doing here? Uh, we came to save you, Papa. Melissa looked between him and Wolfram, who seemed content to watch things unfold. What's going on? Professor Shield. Sam pulled a metal briefcase out of a safe he'd just opened. I have it. Now we can get out of here. Wolfram nodded. Excellent. He glanced at the last of his men behind him. Get the helicopter ready. I'll handle things here. David took a moment to compose himself. Thank you, Sam. Diamond had opened his mouth and said something he prayed was wrong. Professor, are you working with these villains? Izuku. Melissa whirled and glared at him. How could you say that? My father wouldn't eve. It's true, David said, looking Diamond Head in the eye. I hired some actors to play the part of villains, all so that I could get my hands on this. He gestured to the briefcase Sam held. I couldn't let this opportunity slip by. What opportunity? Diamond Head knew that the longer he kept David talking, the longer he had to figure out a way to end this safely. What's in that case? The greatest invention of my career, David said. The QAD quirk amplification device. It pushes the quirk of whoever uses it far beyond what they could ever do on their own. With something like that, anyone who wanted to be a hero, but was rejected because their quirk was too weak would be able to compete with the best. He scowled. But the board said it was too dangerous, especially if it fell into the wrong hands, so they sealed up the prototype and confiscated my research. But that makes sense, Diamond had protested. If a villain got that kind of machine, they'd hurt countless people. It's worth the risk, David shouted, surprising both teenagers. I had to get this back, not for myself, but for All Might. Melissa looked like she was only a step away from shutting down completely. What does Uncle Might have to do with this? All Might is the shining beacon for heroes and the entire world, David said. If that light goes out, there will be chaos. Villains will come out in droves, and no one will feel safe. And that is happening. All Might is getting weaker, and soon, he won't be able to help anyone. 
he stepped towards Sam and the case. But with the QAD boosting his powers, he'll be as strong as he used to be maybe even stronger. Just as David reached for the case, Sam stepped back, and Wolfram moved between them. Diamond had tensed when he saw the gun pointed at David's face. Sorry, Professor, Wolfram sneered, but there's been a change of plans. Out of my way, David ordered. That gun only holds blanks, so you don't scare me. Oh, is that what Sam told you? Wolfram jerked his free thumb over his shoulder. Why don't you explain things, Sam? Sorry, Professor, but Wolfram and his men aren't actors. Sam clutched the case to his chest tightly. I was on board with your plan to steal the QAD because I thought we'd just sell it, but you wanted to give it away. As soon as I heard that, I knew that this theft would have to be real. David gaped at him. Sam, why? Why? I've spent my whole life working for you and I'm not about to give up my chance at a true reward. Sam held out the case. This is what's going to set me up for life. What he said. Wolfram turned and grinned wickedly at Sam. Unfortunately, your life is going to be measured in seconds. Melissa screamed when Wolfram fired. In a stroke of luck, Sam moved the case in the way of the bullet, which skipped off the corner and hit him in the shoulder, rather than the heart. Just as Wolfram fired again to finish the job, David jumped in the way and took the second bullet in his own shoulder. Diamond Head was moving before the second shot had hit. He tried to punch Wolfram, but the villain ducked and placed his hand on the floor. The area around his hand glowed for a moment, and then the floor around Diamond Head warped and flowed almost like water. He was knocked back against a slab of metal, and then Rebar pinned his limbs back. While he was strong enough to break the metal coils, he had no leverage to utilize his strength. Papa, Melissa tried to run to her father, only to get pistol whipped across the face by Wolfram. Your daddy's coming with me, Wolfram said as he aimed the gun at her. And I think he'll be more productive in my employ if he doesn't have you around to distract him. No, Diamond Head was briefly covered in huge spikes that tore through the rebar, and then he fired a burst of crystal shards at the arm holding the gun. Somehow, he managed to destroy the gun, but Wolfram himself was unharmed. Diamond had put himself between Melissa and Wolfram, who already had David slung over his shoulder and the briefcase in hand. Melissa, get the security fixed. I'll save your father. I promise. Melissa hesitated for a moment, then nodded and hurried to the door. Wolfram tried to hit her with more metal, but there was a flash of light, and then Humangausor was there, blocking the slab of metal with one enormous hand. I'm not going to let you touch her, Humangausor growled, and grew to his maximum size. The two became locked in a brief stalemate. Wolfram's every move was smashed apart, but Humangausor couldn't advance. TCH. Wolfram sneered, and then manipulated the floor into a massive wall. Too bad, kid, you can have the island, but I'm still taking the professor and his toy. Humangausser tore through the wall after several punches, but by then, Wolfram was gone. Damn it. Humangausser shrank down to his normal size and followed. Melissa was thankful that Wolfram hadn't left any of his men behind to guard the security center. She was also thankful that she knew how the system worked. The only problem she had was trying to focus. This night had been nothing but a nightmare for her. Her father, the person she loved and respected most, had been kidnapped, only to have staged the whole thing so that he could commit a crime, and had then been shot in front of her and actually kidnapped. Still, she was able to deactivate the security systems and then reset them all across the island. The robots stopped hurting people around, and the lockdown ended. She then watched through the security cameras as the heroes were freed. When she saw All Might punch one of the gunmen into a wall, she felt a little of the tension leave her. Please hurry, she whispered and pulled out her phone. Lemillion had been ready to act the entire time, and when the bonds around he and the other heroes abruptly shut off, he moved. Golden lightning crackled around him as he drove his fist into a gunman's face and then shattered another's rifle before he had a chance to even blink. Nearby, All Might dashed from one criminal to the next, using their bodies as makeshift jackhammers to create craters in the walls and floor. The other heroes were less than a second behind them, taking down the other gunmen quickly and professionally. Melissa must have fixed the security, Lemillion said as he dragged an unconscious man over to the growing pile of captured criminals. Yes, and now, we should hurry to see if anyone needs All Might paused when he heard his phone ring. It's Melissa. Hold on, young Mirio. Lemillion waited impatiently as All Might listened intently, but then his eyes went wide for a moment. Don't worry, Melissa. We're on it. All Might hung up and turned to Lemillion. We don't have much time to act. Dave is being taken to a helicopter on the roof, and only young Midoriya is able to pursue. We have to hurry. All Might, send me on ahead, Lemillion said. I can get there faster than anyone running up some stairs. All Might hesitated, but then nodded. Good point, young Miriel. Do you mind if I give you a boost? I'll catch up as soon as I can. 
Lemillion grinned. Not at all. All Might grabbed the younger man's arm and started to spin, building up momentum. Oklahoma smash. With a mighty heave, All Might threw Lemillion up and at an angle in the direction of the tower's roof. Lemillion used permeation to pass through each floor, but turned it off and on to build up speed until he was getting dangerously close to breaking the sound barrier. He was going to be sore for a while after pushing his limits like this, but if it meant saving someone who needed help, it would be worth it. Hang on, Izuku, I'm on my way. Oh, thank goodness. Ida grimaced as he stretched out his freed legs. That was uncomfortable. Yeyurazu used a deactivated robot to weakly prop herself up. This means that the others got Melissa to the security center. Come on, Yuraraka said, voice urgent, we should catch up. Sui nodded, but then riveted weakly and nearly collapsed. Her legs were horribly bruised, and she would have fallen if Siro hadn't caught her. She smiled at him, and he returned it. Yeyurazu had also used up almost all her lipids and could barely stand, so Ida took it upon himself to carry her on his back. His boosters still needed time to recharge, but he was in better shape than most of them. Yuraraka winced. She felt horrible for not considering how hard they had pushed themselves tonight. She wasn't fully recovered from using her quirk so much during the fight either. Her stomach felt like it was trying to turn itself inside out. Sorry, Deku-kun, she thought, we might be a little late. Okay, that kinda sucked. Ashido sat down on a half-destroyed robot and rubbed her wrists. I'm gonna be sore for a week. Todoroki sat next to her. Yeah, I could use a break. This trip was supposed to be our break. Ashido pouted and put her head on his shoulder. We've got two more days. Good. I'm going to spend them doing absolutely nothing. Sitting across from them, Nejire Chan yawned. Yeah, I think I need a nap. It's been a long night. Sun Eater didn't say anything, but he looked like was about to fall asleep. The peaceful moment lasted about two seconds, and then it was shattered by the sound of shearing metal and an alien roar. I think that was Izuku, Todoroki said, and shot to his feet. Come on. Human Gausser saw the helicopter taking off as he reached the roof. It was just starting to fly when he, now grown to 30 feet tall, grabbed the tail of the helicopter. The tail rotor nicked his shoulder, but his hide was thick enough to absorb the spinning blades with little pain. He reached for David, but the metal skin of the helicopter door morphed into thin blades and stabbed into his hand. They didn't do too much damage, but it surprised Human Gaussor, especially when the blades pushed deeper under his skin, like worms crawling through soil. Better let go, kid, Wolfram taunted, one hand was touching the door while the other held the case. One foot was planted squarely on David's back. If you don't, I will shred your whole arm. Not gonna happen. Human Gausser shot back. I won't stand by when someone needs help. Oh, please. Wolfram rolled his eyes. The professor here doesn't even deserve help. He's tainted now, a man who let his own desires get ahead of everyone's safety. Even if you do rescue him, he'll spend years in prison for this little scheme, and he'll never work in this job again. He's David winced. He's right. Just let go. It's not worth getting hurt over me. It's not human Gausser flinched as the metal dug deeper through his flesh, but didn't let go. It's not about you, it's about Melissa. She just wants her father back, and I promised that I'd do just that. How gallant, Wolfram laughed. Too bad you're going to be down an arm, regardless of what you do. Human Gausser gritted his teeth as the pain grew more intense. The helicopter started to slip from his grasp, and as it did, he let out a roar of defiance. That roar was answered a moment later by a shout of effort, as Lemillion phased through the roof and into the helicopter. Sorry I'm late, he shouted, shoving Wolfram away and grabbing David. He then leapt from the helicopter and landed on the ground. You're good, Midoriya. Take this guy down. With another roar, Human Gausser slammed the chopper down onto the helipad. The entire fuselage crumpled, and shards of metal went everywhere. Human Gausser covered both Lemillion and David with his own body to protect them from shrapnel, even if the former didn't need it. Wow, Lemillion said as he looked at the flaming wreckage of the helicopter. Remind me not to get on your bad side, dude. Human Gausser rubbed his bleeding arm and winced. Sure, as long as there aren't any helicopters involved. Ouch, speaking of ouch, we should get you to a doctor, Lemillion said to David. All Might is on his way too, so this should get wrapped up. Look out. Human Gausser shoved them both out of the way, just as a massive column of metal crashed into him. The metal then wrapped around his body and hefted him into the air. Crazed laughter rang out as Wolfram emerged from the wreckage. He'd removed his helmet and replaced it with a fragile-looking machine. Even though he wasn't touching any metal with his hands, the metal helipad was bending to his will, and whole chunks of the tower were ripped out to orbit him in a growing cloud. This is amazing. I had never felt so powerful. Wolfram grinned madly. Forget selling this thing to the highest bidder. With this kind of power, no one can stop me. 
Human Gausser struggled, but his arms were pinned to his sides, and he couldn't reach the Ultimatrix dial. All he could do was watch as Wolfram lifted more metal into the air, sharpened them into blades, and sent them hurtling at Lamillion and David. Heaven-piercing ice wall. A huge wave of ice met the metal with a horrible screech, halting the blades in place. A moment later, Ashido fell from the sky and hit the metal-binding human Gausor with her strongest acid. The metal melted in seconds, and he fell to the roof. Midori, catch me. Thankfully, Ashido landed in Human Gaussor's outstretched hands. Whoa, that was cool. Wolfram hastily raised a shield of debris to block a massive wave of energy. He glared up at Nejire Chan, who was so exhausted that she couldn't attack and fly at the same time. She was resting on Sun Eater's back, and she slumped forward as he landed behind Lamillion. Human Gaussor and Ashido joined them and braced themselves for whatever came next, but most of them weren't in any shape for a fight. Nejire Chan was almost unconscious, Todoroki had nearly frozen himself with his best move. Ashido's arms were covered in acid burns, and Sun Eater was busy keeping them all from falling off the roof. Only Human Gaussor and Lamillion could fight the empowered villain. Hey, freshman. Human Gaussor glanced at Lamillion, who was glaring at Wolfram. You ready to take this guy down? Human Gaussor cracked his neck. Absolutely. A couple of kids, huh? Wolfram threw more debris at them. This'll be a warm-up for when a real hero gets here. Lamillion phased through the metal, while Human Gaussor batted it away. We are heroes, the former shouted. We save lives, and we stop people like you. That's what being a hero is all about. And it's not just us, Human Gaussor added. Everyone who fought with us, who risked their lives to save the people on this island, all of them are real heroes. Yeah, you tell him, Deku-kun. Hiroraka cheered as she and the others, including Melissa, joined them. Papa, Melissa knelt by her father and tried to stop the bleeding. Cyril provided her with some tape to at least apply pressure. Melissa David looked away. I'm so sorry. I just wanted. Don't talk now, Melissa interrupted. Just you can tell me everything later. Lamillion drove his fist into Wolfram's chest. But even with the strength of one for all, all he did was knock the man back a single step. He was so surprised that he didn't react in time to avoid a punch in return. The blow was so strong that it sent him crashing into a pile of debris even with one for all enhancing his durability. That doesn't make sense, Human Gausser said as he narrowly avoided another moving column. His quirk involves metal. That's one of my quirks, Wolfram corrected, as his muscles bulged. I got another when my employer mentioned that All Might would be here. Lamillion froze. All Might had told him of a villain who could bestow quirks onto other people. But you work for all for one. Wolfram shrugged. Never met him before this job, but anyone who's anyone in the criminal underworld has heard about him. He's a legend, a boogeyman, and everyone kicks something up to him, whether they know it or not. He wanted to hurt All Might by ruining his closest friend, and the money was good. And with this little toy as a bonus, I'd say that it was worth the hassle. Human Gausser didn't know what they were talking about, but he understood that there was someone pulling the strings. He could think about that later, though, right now, they had to stop Wolfram. First, the Wolfram rose up on a makeshift platform of metal and formed huge cubes that orbited around him. Let's clear the board of all these weaklings. Izuku, then floated next to Human Gausor, more serious than ever. This is a serious threat. If he does any more damage, he could topple the whole tower. I don't think you need a better reason to have this. He placed his hand on the Ultimatrix dial, twisted it, and then slapped it. Four spikes emerged, and Ben nodded. Hyper-evolutionary feature now active. Go get him, buddy. Human Gausor started to change. He grew taller and more muscular, and his skin turned green. Dark blue armored plates grew on his chest and especially his back, while his tail ended in a spiked mace, and silver barrel-like protrusions grew over his knuckles. What's this? Wolfram called down from his growing platform. Are you going plus ultra, like All Might always goes on about? No, Ultimate Human Gausser said in an even deeper voice than before. I'm going plus ultimate. Wolfram launched the cubes, but Ultimate Human Gausser simply raised his hands, which morphed into what looked like quad-barreled cannons. Each barrel fired a series of organic missiles that obliterated the cubes with massive explosions. That's what I'm talking about. Ben cheered. Show that guy what you can really do. Lamillion, Ultimate Human Gausser growled and the older boy got to his feet. Let's go. You got it. Lamillion's body crackled with golden lightning, and he vanished in a blur. Wolfram barely brought up a sheet of metal in time to block Lamillion, but it didn't matter. His fist simply phased through the barrier and smashed into Wolfram's face. The villain shook it off, but was nearly knocked off his platform by another barrage from Ultimate Human Gausor. 
The explosions were so powerful that the shockwaves nearly sent the others flying. The only reason Melissa didn't fall off the roof was because Ciro and Asui grabbed her at the last minute with their respective quirks. Lemillion started popping in and out of the metal surrounding Wolfram. He would dart out, land a punch or kick, and then dart back in. Every time Wolfram tried to counterattack, his weapons would be destroyed by Ultimate Human Gaussor, or his personal attack would simply go through Lemillion. Ultimate Human Gaussor marched up to the slowly growing defenses surrounding Wolfram, firing as he went. Some cables hung underneath and they were close enough to grab with his incredible strength. Ultimate Human Gaussor started dragging the whole thing down like the world's ugliest kite. When it was close enough, he smashed through the last bit of armor that Wolfram had summoned and drew back one fist. Now, Ultimate Human Gaussor shouted. Take this, Lemillion built up more and more speed and then solidly connected his fist with Wolfram's jaw. Phantom Menace. Rather than call out a flashy move, Ultimate Human Gaussor roared and punched Wolfram in the chest. The villain spun wildly through the air from the different angles of the two punches and collapsed. Blood trickled from his mouth, and from the lumpy way his chest looked, he probably had a few broken ribs. The QAD slipped from his head and broke into pieces. There was a moment of silence as everyone processed what had happened. They did it, Iroraka shouted, and that set off cheers from everyone. The celebration ended almost immediately when the massive platform Wolfram had been using began to tilt and break apart. We need to stop that stuff. Lemillion ran forward and grabbed a cable, only for it to violently separate from the rest. It's going to land on anyone below us. Allow me to help with that. All Might boomed as he rocketed up from a lower floor. It seems I got here in time to help after all. All Might, can you push the largest part away from the tower? Ultimate Human Gaussor asked. He had no time to feel relief at the man's arrival. That way, I can destroy it without damaging anything else. All Might took in Midoriya's new appearance with only a split second of surprise and then nodded. Leave that to me, young Midoriya, and I'll stop the smaller pieces from hitting us, Lemillion said as he dashed off. Here we go, young Midoriya. All Might drew back his fist and then punched. Detroit smash. The air blast sent the makeshift asteroid flying up and away and gave ultimate human Gaussor a clear shot. With a roar, he fired as many missiles as he could in a wide spread. In seconds, the entire thing was destroyed in a massive explosion that briefly gave I Island an early sunrise. As that happened, Lemillion punched and kicked chunks of debris away from the rest of the group. He winced when he knocked away a car-sized piece of solid metal, but that knocked him off course. Only a desperate tackle at the last second saved Melissa from another piece of debris that would have taken her head off. The two rolled down the stairs and landed in a heap, with Melissa on top of him. Okay, oh, Lemillion said as he sat up. He looked Melissa in the eye and smiled. Are you okay? Melissa nodded and then hugged him tightly. Thank you, she murmured. You and Izuku saved my father. Lemillion stood and helped her to her feet. Hey, that's what heroes do. Melissa wiped away tears. It doesn't mean I can't thank you. Ultimate human Gaussor reverted to his unevolved state and then turned back to human, just in time for Uraraka to grab him in a rib-cracking hug. She barely had time to kiss him before the rest of the rising stars crashed into them, and they fell into a messy pile of bruised limbs and laughter. We did it. Sira wiped away tears of relief. I can't believe we did all that. We saved guys, we saved everyone. That was awesome, Ashido said, and sprawled out over almost everyone. Crazy and exhausting, but awesome. Asui brought a finger to her cheek. Do you think we'll get extra credit for this? As the students laughed again, All Might knelt by his friend. Dave Melissa told me a little about what you did. David looked down at his hands. I know, Toshi, I just couldn't see a world without your light in it. But after tonight, he looked over at the students, at the rising stars as they chatted and embraced, at Nejire Chan and Sun Eater who had practically passed out next to each other, and at Melissa and Lemillion, who didn't seem to realize that they were still hugging. After tonight, All Might finished and looked out at the first rays of sunrise. I think the world is going to have light to spare. So, my grandfather came home from the hospital a few days ago and then went right back in. Are you kidding me? When All Might led the students and David downstairs, they were swarmed by police, paramedics, and other heroes. At first, Midoriya and his friends tried to stay together, but they were eventually pulled apart to be treated for injuries and interviewed by the police. All Might delivered the unconscious Wolfram to the police and then had a quiet word with the officers. Shortly afterward, they escorted David to the hospital. 
Thankfully, no one else needed to visit the hospital and were cleared by the paramedics. Asui was told to do as little as possible to let her legs heal, and Ishida was given similar instructions regarding her arms. Ida needed to rest his legs because he'd overused his engines a little, and Todoroki had accidentally overheated himself, so he had to cover himself in a thin layer of ice for a little while. Siro was dehydrated, and Yayurazu had almost completely drained her lipids. Midoriya had healed himself as swamp fire. Only Yuraraka had escaped the fighting with little more than some bruises. The big three were in similar states. Hato had a minor concussion. Amajiki's arms were bandaged, and Tagata was using some of Todoroki's ice on his bruises. Once everyone had been treated, and Midoriya had assured his parents that he was fine through hugs and crying, they were able to reunite by the buffet table which had somehow survived the chaos. The heroes and the police had cleared away the crowds, leaving Midoriya to explain what he'd learned to his friends. I can't believe Professor Shield would do that, Yeirazu said around a mouthful of food, too tired and hungry to care about manners for the moment. I looked him up after you talked about him, and he seemed too upstanding a person to commit a crime. He had good intentions, Midoriya argued. He was just blinded to everything else, including his own daughter. Ida shook his head. Regardless of his intentions, his actions allowed for villains to infiltrate I Island and could have caused serious harm to many people. I doubt he will not face consequences for this. What will happen to Melissa, Ribbit? Asui tilted her head. If her father goes to jail, she'll be all alone. Tagata coughed to get their attention. I overheard All Might mention her to her father. Actually, whatever he said made the professor more relaxed. Cool, so All Might is handling it. Ashido grabbed a plate full of brownies from the table handed most of them to Yeyorazu, and then paused and turned to Amajiki. If you eat one of these, will you turn into a brownie? I hope not, Hato said brightly, he's already sweet. Amajiki started to turn to the nearest wall to hide his face, but Hato grabbed him in a hug and kept him in place. I'm just glad it's over, Yuraraka said, and rested her head on Midoriya's shoulder. It is over, right? Everyone is done with us. I think so, Siro said, and then finished his third bottle of water. They might just be double-checking our statements before letting us go back to our rooms. Ashido sighed. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I need a hot shower, clean clothes, and ten hours of sleep. There was no disagreement from anyone. Of the big three, only Tagata's costume was undamaged, but it was still filthy from dirt and sweat. The rising star's clothes were dirty, torn, and sweat-stained. Ashido, Todoroki and Ida had the worst. Ashido's dress had dozens of tiny holes from stray droplets of acid. Todoroki had burned off most of his shirt, and Ida's pants had become shorts after using his quirk. Eventually, the students were escorted to their rooms by a group of heroes, but as they walked, Siro realized something. Hey, we never did find out why Nejair and Tamaki were up on the 80th floor. The big three remained behind a little longer to speak with All Might, but as they waited, Tagata elbowed Amajiki. I saw how Nejair was acting with you, dude, did you finally tell her? Amajiki had wanted to use the time before the preview to finally confess his feelings to Hado, feelings that had been building for over two years. He had ended up babbling about everything except his feelings to her, and they had wandered around the tower, eventually reaching the 80th floor, and the insanity had begun. Not really. Amajiki tried to look away, but ended up making eye contact with Hado, who beamed at him. But, oh, I think she knows. It was already 6 in the morning by the time everyone went to sleep and Izuku eventually woke up at almost four in the afternoon. His parents were still asleep, so he went to their room's modest kitchen to make himself something to eat. While he waited for his food to heat up, he checked his messenger app. All might, hey, everyone feeling better? Look, I am. The other girls all slept in my room. Crayon, we were too turd to make it to our rooms, and our room is huge. All might, are you both messaging from the same room? Comet, no, we all went back to our rooms an hour ago. How are you, Deku-kun? All might, better. Still trying to wrap my head around what the professor did. Glasses, someone you respect did something reprehensible. I am sure it will take some time to process it. Also, hello, everyone. I am feeling better as well. Snowflake, my father somehow found out about what happened. He's been calling me over and over for three hours. Crayon, are you in trouble? Do I need to melt his shoes or something? Snowflake, that would be funny if you did. No, he's been praising me. It's been weird, please help. Tape, tell him he's interrupting your recovery. If all else fails, turn off your phone. Frog, everyone please shut up. I'm tired and my legs hurt, and I want to sleep. Izuku nearly dropped his phone when Asui's all caps message came in. He considered sending an apology, but figured that would just annoy her further. From the way no one else responded, he wasn't the only one to reach that conclusion. 
Why didn't she just turn off her phone? Ben asked. Maybe she didn't want to seem rude. I think she did that when she text yelled at you all all all. Ben flickered wildly in place for a moment, then stabilized. Izuku frowned. Are you okay? Ben shrugged. My software is having a little trouble equalizing with the hyper-evolutionary feature. There's some programming clash, but it's fi fi fine. He flickered again. It will be fine. If you say so. Izuku started to eat his food. Hey, how did you turn the dial and make me go plus ultimate? Is that the term you're sticking with? Okay. Then floated over and sat in a chair. Well, since I activated the function, I was able to rem rem remotely use it. Remember, I'm a tutorial program, so I had to be able to show you how to activate it. That makes sense, but why were you there to turn and hit the dial? You didn't need your hologram out for that. Oh, that. Ben grinned. I thought it would be cool. Izuku rolled his eyes. Really? Hey, you're gonna do a billion heroic things in your life, let me have this. Ben was obviously joking, but it made Izuku think. You know you're just as responsible for me becoming a hero as I am, right? Ben blinked. How do you figure? Well, if you hadn't chosen me to use the Ultimatrix, I wouldn't have done all these things. Ben shrugged. I guess. But all I did was give you the tools you needed to be a hero. I'm sure you would have done other things to help people if I hadn't shown up. Izuku mumbled something self-deprecating into his food, but didn't argue further. Hey, your parents are waking up, Ben said. Why don't you make him breakfast or something? Why yeah, and then maybe we can actually enjoy our stay here. Izuku spent most of the rest of the day with his parents, but he did meet up with his friends that evening at a restaurant. The first thing Asui did when she saw them was bow her head. I'm really sorry about earlier, Ribbit, she said. Ashida waved her off. Eh, hey, now we know that you're not a morning frog. It's cool. Geyarazu noticed something odd. Are people looking at us? Hisashi glanced up from his menu. Yeah, I've been seeing that all day. The news mentioned you kids after all that happened at the preview, nothing much, just that you were a big help with averting the crisis. So this is what it's like to be a celebrity. Siro's only sign of nervousness was how tightly he gripped his cup of water. At least it's good practice for when we're pro heroes. Indeed, out of all of them, Ida seemed genuinely composed. My brother has mentioned that it makes going out difficult. Your brother wears a helmet that hides his face, Ashido pointed out. How do people even know who he is when he's not in costume? Ida sighed. He made the mistake of taking off his helmet during a few interviews last year, and now his fans know what he looks like. He shuddered. Just before I started at UA, I was shopping with him, and some woman asked to have his babies. Sounds like a typical fangirl, Todoroki commented. She was old enough to be my grandmother. Siro nearly choked on his water. Oh my god, that's hilarious. Please tell me we can meet him someday, I want to ask him about that. Izuku joined in on the laughter. But when they calmed down, he noticed Yuraraka appearing at the Ultimatrix. Is something wrong, Achako? I've been meaning to ask, Deku-kun. She pointed to the watch. What was that thing you did during the fight? You mean Ultimate Human Gausor? His friends and parents all nodded. Well, my normal transformations are just that, normal. But I can push a few of my forms past their limit for a little while. It's like a second transformation, with new powers. Since they were in public, everyone knew that that wasn't the whole truth, but it was enough for them to understand. Izuku had mentioned an ultimate function before, but had never gone into detail, because he didn't know much. They knew he'd explain in more detail when there weren't any eavesdroppers. How many of them have this boost, Ribbit? Only ten, according to Ben. They all knew he meant the hologram, not the real Ben. But I had to get stronger with my quirk before I could even try. Translation. Izuku had met another standard of Ben's programming, unlocking a new part of the Ultimatrix. I can't wait to see Bakugo's face when you pull that move, Ashido said, a little too gleefully. Siro unconsciously scratched the scar on his jaw. Oh, please let me be there when that happens. Okay, kids, enough of that, Inko said, though she couldn't keep the smile off her face. Let's just enjoy dinner for now. The teenagers all obeyed, but none of them could stop the image of Bakugo throwing a fit from popping into their minds. Hey, Dave. David cracked open his eyes and saw All Might in his skinny form and wearing normal clothes, sitting across from him. He tried to sit up, but the handcuffs only let him move so far on the hospital bed. Hey, Toshi. How's the shoulder? David chuckled. Better now that there isn't a bullet lodged in there. I'll bet. All Might leaned back in his chair. Sorry, Dave, but I have to ask you something. I already told the police about everything I did. Just one question, and it might be important. All Might looked directly at him, and even with his eyes sunken, David could see the fire that drove the man. Fine, go ahead. Did Wolfram ever mention someone named All for One, or where he was before you hired him? David raised an eyebrow. He didn't talk about much, and he definitely didn't say anything about an All for One. 
He did mention that he was in Japan recently, though. All Might nodded and tapped his chin. So he's probably still there. Maybe he never even left. I should have investigated sooner. I could have picked up his trail. Toshi, what's this about? All Might stood abruptly, but the sudden movement made him cough up blood. Sorry, Dave, I shouldn't have said even that much. David winced. Once upon a time, the man told him almost everything. Now, All Might was all business, and David had only himself to blame. Just tell me two things, he pleaded, he waited until All Might nodded, and then spoke. First, is this guy really that dangerous? More dangerous than anyone I've ever fought. At that, David's eyes narrowed. Then that leads me to the other thing. Promise me that you won't let this bastard near my daughter. For a moment, All Might switched to his muscle form, and David let himself think that his friend was back to his former glory, if only for an instant. That, Dave, is something I swear to do. Later that night, Midoriya and Yuraka managed to find some time to themselves, wandering through the shopping centers of I Island. Midoriya took her hand in his, shyly at first, but with growing confidence, Yuraka leaned in closer to put her head on his shoulder. Now this is how I thought this trip would go, she said. You and me, walking on a beautiful island. Why yeah. Midoriya took a moment to enjoy holding her entire hand. She was wearing gloves that left the ring and pinky fingers exposed, so he could hold her hand without fear of accidentally floating away. I kinda wished we could've had that dance, though, Yuraraka said wistfully, and then she paused. Wait, I don't know how to dance. Midoriya tried not to laugh. W well, neither do I. They looked at each other and broke out in a fit of giggles. When Midoriya finally got control of himself, he spotted a familiar figure sitting on a bench, wearing the same kind of outfit she'd had when they first met. Hey, there's Melissa. What's she doing here? Yuraraka followed his gaze. Sure enough, Melissa was there, and it was heartbreaking. The poor girl looked like she was about to cry, and the people walking by acted like she didn't exist. The news had broken that her father had been at least partially responsible for the villain attack, and even though Melissa had helped to fix things, the public saw her as guilty by association. Midoriya looked from their friend to his girlfriend. Achako, I know we were. Yuraraka immediately shook her head. This is important, let's go see if we can cheer her up. Melissa looked up from staring at her knees when she felt Yuraraka's hand on her shoulder. Oh, Achako, Izuku, what are you doing here? We were on a date, Yuraraka said as she sat next to the older girl. Well, don't stop on my account. Melissa tried to sound cheerful, but anyone could see how upset she was. Midoriya wanted to ask what was wrong, but he knew she was still processing everything that had happened since the night before. How's, um how's your dad? He asked. Melissa flinched. He was arrested. He confessed to everything a few hours ago, so he's definitely going to prison. Yuraraka bit her lip. For how long? At least ten years, Melissa said, forcing back a sob. Maybe he can get paroled in five if he behaves. And even if he does get out early, his career is over. I'm sorry, Midoriya said, even if he wasn't sure what he was sorry for. Melissa took off her glasses and rubbed her eyes. It just it hurts. It hurts, and I don't know what to do. Well, let's find somewhere a little quieter, and then we can figure it out, Yuraraka said, and looped her arm through Melissa's. After a meaningful look at her boyfriend, Midoriya did the same with Melissa's other arm. Melissa sniffed. Thanks. Melissa ended up staying with them the rest of the evening, and joined the rising stars a little later. Yeyurazu saw that she really needed friends, so she decided that all the girls would stay in her room that night. You don't have to process things alone, she said to Melissa. Even if you don't want to talk about it, we'll be there if you need us. Melissa managed to hold the tears back until she and the other girls were in Yeyurazu's room, and then a flood that would have impressed the Midoriya was let loose. Asui, who had no problem getting completely soaked, volunteered to hug her for as long as necessary. After almost an hour of crying and babbling, Melissa finally started to calm down, and then someone knocked on the door, making them all jump. That better not be one of the boys, Ashido half-joked, and then called out, we're not decent. Mina, Achako tried to hit her, even though the girls were all wearing either long nightgowns or other modest sleepwear. It's me. Hado's muffled voice came through the door. Can I come in? Yeyurazu opened the door, allowing Hado to come through with several bags. What are you doing here, Nejire? Mirio and Tamaki and I thought Melissa might need some company, but we couldn't find you. Hado smiled as she sat next to Melissa. Then Izukun told us you were here, so we decided to bring you some of your stuff. Melissa opened a bag and found toiletries. The others contained clothes and even some books. Wait, this is all from my room. How did you get all this? Oh, that. Hado grinned unrepentantly. Nirio phased his arm through the door and unlocked it, and then I grabbed a bunch of your stuff. Don't worry, I was the only one who went inside. The other girls weren't sure what to do with Hado's confession to breaking and entering. 
For the sake of their sanity, they decided to let it go since it was for a good cause. Besides, Hado soon had all of them in a better mood with her energy and upbeat personality, and when even Melissa laughed a few times, they considered it a win. I can't say this trip went like I thought it would, Hisashi said, scratching the back of his head. But I'm glad I got to see you too. Izuku hugged his father tightly. Me too, dad. He looked up. Do you? Do you think we could do this again soon? Isashi glanced at Inko, and both smiled sadly. Sorry, kiddo, I don't know. I'd love nothing more than to see you both all the time, you know that. But, Izuku nodded. He had spent most of his life understanding why his father couldn't stay home. It didn't stop him from wishing otherwise. But I'll try to call more often, Isashi said. At least four days a week, definitely the weekends. I'd like that. It was more than Izuku had before, he would take what he could get. Isashi ruffled his son's hair. Don't be so sure, I'm still gonna tease you about your girlfriend. Say, did she and your other friends already leave? Izuku nodded. Yeah, their plane took off an hour ago. He grinned. You were too busy making out with mom to notice. Finally, it was his parents' turn to go red-faced, and Izuku allowed himself to feel a sense of triumph. Hisashi gave his family another hug. Seriously, though, I'm going to miss you both. I love you so much. We love you too, Inko said, holding on to him tightly. We'll talk again as soon as we can. Hisashi let Inko go, but stayed a little longer with his son. Izuku, I can't tell you how proud of you I am. You're going to be an amazing pro, but as far as I'm concerned, you're already a hero. Izuku tried and failed to blink away his tears. Th thanks, dad. You earned it. Isashi paused. Hey, Ben. Ben couldn't risk someone seeing him, so he just answered from within the Ultimatrix. Yes, sir. Don't call me sir, it makes me feel old. Isashi laughed for a moment. Anyway, I wanted to thank you for helping Izuku realize his dream. I've said it before, all I did was give Izuku the tools he needed to succeed. Izuku could easily imagine Ben smiling proudly. Everything else was all him. Then I still have to thank you. Isashi reached out and tapped the watch. Keep an eye on Izuku, though, he seems to get in trouble a lot. Hey. Izuku protested, but Hisashi and Ben both laughed. Hisashi ruffled his son's hair one more time. All right, you all had better get going. Your plane leaves soon, right? Izuku hugged him and then stepped back so that Inko could take his place. He blushed when his father pulled his mother in for a deep kiss. Since I know it'll be a while before we can do that again, Hisashi whispered. I love you. Inko blinked away tears. I know. She reluctantly pulled away. She and Izuku grabbed their bags and headed for their plane. Hisashi waved until they disappeared into the crowd and then looked at his phone. Ah, well, I've got a few hours before my flight, he muttered to himself. Might as well get some coffee. He had just started going to a coffee shop nearby when his phone rang. Hisashi hesitated. There were less than 10 people who had his cell number and two of them had just boarded a plane. He looked at the caller ID and he felt a chill go down his spine. Hisashi found a quiet corner in the shop and brought the phone to his ear. Yes, sir. Oh, don't sound so formal, Hisashi. The voice of the man on the other end of the line was very aware that he could make or break Hisashi's career, and took a perverse delight in teasing him. I heard about what happened on a island. Terrible, really, and on your vacation. Is your family all right? Why, yes, they are. Hisashi took a deep breath. My son actually helped resolve things. Really? Your son won the UA Sports Festival, didn't he? And sure he has a bright future ahead of him. I don't suppose he'd accept us as a sponsor when he becomes a pro hero, would he? Er, I'm sure he'd be grateful to have a sponsor like you, sir. Well, I'll keep an eye on his progress when he graduates, and we'll see where things go. The man seemed genuinely satisfied, though Hisashi had no idea why. Enjoy the rest of your vacation, Hisashi, oh, and before I forget, you'll be getting a bonus to your salary, as compensation for your troubles. Oh, thank you, sir. It's absolutely no problem. His boss dismissed, and Hisashi could almost see him waving his hand. Besides, after all your hard work for us, you deserve it. This is just an excuse to give you the reward you so rightfully deserve. Hisashi knew he wouldn't have earned a bonus if he hadn't deserved it. Thank you again, sir, I promise that I'll work even harder. Glad to hear it. I look forward to hearing that you've arrived safely in London. With that, the line went dead. Hisashi sank into his chair, one hand over his rapidly beating heart. Despite the good news, he found himself wanting something stronger than coffee. Why does that man always scare me so much? Excuse me, sir. What is it? Is the Midoriya boy really so important? Powerful or not, he's just a child. All Might was just a child, once, and look at him now. That is why I am investing so much into Hisashi now, though I admit that he does good work for us. Either he becomes a way to convince his son to join us, or he becomes a hostage to control him. Of course, sir. 
Is there anything else you require? No, curious, you may go. Yatsubashi Rikia, known to his followers as Redistro, waited for his lieutenant to close the door behind him. I am a businessman, he thought. Regardless of how it is achieved, the Midoriya boy is an investment worth pursuing for the revolution. When Midoriya came back to school on Monday, he and the other rising stars were quickly surrounded by most of their class. Dude, I can't believe you guys fought villains on my island. Kaminari grabbed Siro by the front of his shirt and shook him. How are you all so lucky? Jiro smacked Kaminari upside the head. Lucky, they could have been killed. She turned to Yeyarazu. Are you all okay, Yamomo? Other than some bumps and bruises, we're all fine, Yeyurazu assured the rest of the class. Now, please return to your seats before Aizawa-sensei gets here. I'm sure none of us want detention the week before the summer camp. That got the rest of the class moving, but Midoriya suddenly found Bekugo walking next to him. You kicked the villain's ass, right, nerd? His voice was low, so no one else could hear him. W well, we beat him, Midoriya said. Bakugo narrowed his eyes and nodded. Good, it won't feel as good to beat you if some shitty villain gets there before me. Bakugo nodded again, as if that settled the matter. Midoriya sat down next to Yuraraka, who looked at him with concern, but he shrugged. This was probably the closest Bakugo would ever get to respecting him. Class 1 I had just settled down when Aizawa entered the room. He looked even more tired than usual, if that was possible. His gaze seemed to linger on the rising stars, and there was a calculating gleam in his eyes. All right, get ready for class, he said. And the first person to talk about I Island gets detention for the rest of the year. The media has been hounding the school for answers for hours. I couldn't take it anymore, so I threw all might at them. More than one student suddenly had the mental image of Aizawa literally throwing a man several times his own weight at a crowd of reporters. It sparked a few giggles, which died down when Aizawa's eyes glowed. Moving on, don't even think about slacking off just because this is the week before summer camp. If I think you're dropping the ball, I'll make sure you miss that bus. Despite the threat, Aizawa didn't make them do any extra work, and only insisted that they complete any unfinished assignments before crawling into his sleeping bag. Once the students were sure he wasn't going to tear into them, they got out of their seats and chatted quietly amongst themselves. Okay, so, I'm bringing stuff for S'mores, Ashido said. Hanta, you said you have some scary ghost stories. Yeah, some old books I found in my house. Ciro's grin remained, but he still shivered. I only read a few of them, and they were terrifying. Yuraraka bounced in her seat. Oh, this is gonna be so much fun. Ida chopped at the air. We must first work diligently before we do any goofing off. This camp is not just for fun, you know. He's right, Todoroki said. This is a chance for us to really work on getting stronger, and we shouldn't waste it. Ashido pouted and put her head on his shoulder, which resulted in one of her horns poking his cheek. Aw, don't be like that, Shoto. Just because we're all working hard doesn't mean we can't have fun. After everything that's happened so far, I think we deserve some relaxing summer nights. Why you're both right, Midoriya said, not completely sure if Ashido and Todoroki were about to argue. We have to work hard, but we shouldn't burn ourselves out. Yuraraka nodded. Yeah, just think of every night as a reward for every day of hard work. Just be sure that you do earn that reward, Yeyarazu said sternly, but then saw their homeroom teacher walking over to them, phone in hand. Aizawa-sensei, is something wrong? Aizawa shrugged. Not really. Midoriya, Yuraraka, the principal wants to see you both after class. It's about Iri. When he saw the teenager's eyes go wide, he sighed. It's not bad. Nezu just figured out her quirk over the weekend and wanted to fill you in. If you really want to help her, you should know this. Midoriya and Yuraraka shared a look and then nodded. Thank you, Aizawa-sensei, Yuraraka said. Aizawa shrugged again. I still have to be on hand in case her quirk goes out of control. Thank me when that stops happening. Midoriya and Yuraraka practically sprinted out of class when the day ended, the rest of their friends seconds behind them. Three might have been attached to her rescuers above everyone else, but the rest of the rising stars had quickly become just as protective. Within seconds of arriving at Nezu's office, Iri was hugging Midoriya's legs, while Yuraraka knelt next to her and gently patted her head. I missed you, Iri said softly. And we missed you too, Iri-chan. Midoriya leaned down to hug her back. Did you have fun while we were gone? Iri shrugged. She still wasn't sure what fun was, but at least she wasn't unhappy. We did learn something interesting, Nezu said from his desk, and then winked at the students. Excellent work on I Island, by the way. Thank you, Nezu-sensei, Yeyurazu said with a short bow. But what about Iri-chan? 
Aizawa sensei said you found out what her quirk is. Ah, uh, yes, quite the discovery, actually. Nezu typed at his computer for a moment, and then turned the monitor around to face them. Watch this. A recording began to play. Nezu was speaking to Iri, and Aizawa was in the corner, ready to erase Iri's quirk if necessary. Nezu slid over a plate that held a piece of uncooked chicken to the confused girl. Please use your quirk on the chicken, Iri-chan, Nezu said in the recording. You don't have to worry about hurting it, since it's dead. Iri tentatively reached out and pressed a single finger against the dead flesh. A moment later, her horn grew and glowed. Aizawa erased her quirk less than three seconds later, and when the light faded, there was a whole chicken standing on the table, alive and likely very confused. Iri-chan has a very special quirk, Nezu said as the recording ended. At first, we thought she disintegrated organic material, but that was incorrect. What she actually does is rewind time around organic material, bringing it back to a previous state of existence. Unfortunately, her quirk is so powerful that it can rewind them to before they existed, effectively destroying them. However, if used in extremely small doses, her quirk is capable of amazing things such as undoing injuries, or even bringing the dead back to life. Most of the students process this with no small amount of awe. Midoriya kept looking between Iri who was now held in Yuraraka's arms and the notebook he was putting all this down in. Quirks like Iri's were extraordinarily rare. They were rarer still for being so powerful in someone so young. That's incredible, Iri-chan, Midoriya said quietly. The little girl shook her head and clutched Yuraraka tightly. But I hurt people. Remember what I said, Iri-chan. Nezu smiled kindly. A quirk is only dangerous if you don't know how to use it, and this is the perfect place for you to learn. Once you do, you could help so many people. He's right. Midoriya gently stroked her hair. If someone is hurt or sick, you could make them better. Nezu had already told Iri as much over the weekend, but hearing the words from Midoriya's mouth was much more reassuring. We plan to give Iri weekly lessons to control her quirk, Nezu said. Once she's more settled, we may increase it to twice a week. If it's not too much trouble, I'd like Midoriya-san and Yuraraka-san to be there for these lessons. I'm sure it will make Iri-chan more comfortable. Midoriya and Yuraraka looked at each other, and then at Iri, who had fallen asleep in the latter's arms, and holding two of the former's fingers in one tiny hand. There really was only one answer they could give. Of course, Nezu-sensei. Shortly before school the next day, the Rising Stars got a text from Tagata, asking them to meet up with him at the support department before lunch was over. They were curious, but the text didn't hint at anything urgent, so they were content to wait. After eating lunch, they headed out, only to be intercepted halfway there by a pink-topped blur. Of course, they smelled Hatsum before they saw her. By this time in the day, she practically reeked of sweat, oil, smoke, and several other chemicals that were probably unhealthy to be around for long periods of time. Hey, guys. Hatsum waved at them with a hand holding a screwdriver, which went back to adjusting the innards of what looked like a cross between an old alarm clock and a hand grenade. Hi, May, Midoriya said, they weren't especially close friends with Hatsum, but she had insisted on them using her first name. It wasn't because of any sentimental reason, she just thought that conversations would go by faster if people addressed her by her first name, which meant she could go back to work sooner. Are you all headed to the support department? Hatsum's eyes went wide, and she grinned wildly. Are you all getting upgrades or new support items? Can I help? Uh, sorry, I don't think so, Yuraraka said. She was always a little put off by Hatsum's energy, which eclipsed Toshido's and Hado's combined. We were just asked to stop by. Okay, fine. Oh, Achako, uh, I've been tweaking that request you made a while back, and I think I can reduce drag by another 4%, which should increase your speed. Nobody took offense that Hatsum basically ignored the rest of them. She couldn't even remember someone's name unless she was working on something for them, and that only lasted a few days after it was finished. The only exception was Midoriya, but only because Hatsum kept asking him questions about the Ultimatrix. Thanks, May. Yuraraka glanced at the others, who shrugged. They could tell that Hatsum wasn't even thinking about them, so it was all on her. Um, why are you headed to the support department? Lunch isn't over yet. Hatsum rolled her eyes, and then turned her attention to her gadget. She would have walked into a wall, had Ida not gently steered her in the right direction. Power Loader Sensei wants me to work with a third-year student, something about being guided by someone with more experience. Maybe he's hoping you won't blow up the classroom so much, Siro muttered. Hatsum's accidental demolition of school property was already infamous. Midoriya almost commented, but when they rounded the next corner, he froze. No way. Tagata noticed them, and gently elbowed Melissa, wearing a UA uniform, to get her attention. She turned from her conversation with Power Loader and smiled. Hey, guys, surprised to see me. 
There was a moment of stunned silence, and then Ishido sprinted over and hugged her. Hey, girl, what are you doing here? Power Loader chuckled. Shield-san transferred here today. As of now, she's a UA third-year student. For the first time that day, Hatsum's attention was away from her babies. Instead, she stared at Melissa with such intensity that her quirk activated for a moment. Wait, Shield. As in Professor David Shield. Hatsum ran over and shoved Ishido out of the way. Please tell me you're related to David Shield. Melissa sighed, but unlike an eye island, mention of her father didn't bring her to tears. Yes, he's my dad. Hatsum grabbed her by the shoulders. Teach me everything you know. Power Loader gently pried Hatsum off Melissa. How about you let her get situated before you pick her brain? Okay. It was hard to tell with his helmet on, but he might have given Melissa an apologetic glance. If you don't mind, Shield-san, Hatsum can show you around the workshops. She knows them as well as I do. Um, sure. Melissa looked uneasy, especially when Tagata had to hold a flailing Hatsum back. Not that we aren't happy to see you, Melissa, Ida said, but why are you here? I thought you had to remain on my island. Melissa smiled bitterly. That rule only applies to active employees and their families. Since Papa was arrested, I didn't have to stay. But Uncle Might is also my godfather and legal guardian, so I was allowed to live with him. There's still some paperwork to get through, but I just have to remain on campus for a few days, and then I'll be a Japanese citizen. That's wonderful. Yayorazu beamed. Just be careful about the press, Todoroki warned. You're the daughter of someone famous, and if they find out you're living with All Might, they'll never leave you alone. Melissa's smile turned crafty. Oh, I've already got an idea for how to get past them. Oh, oh, is it Kamotech? Hatsum nearly dislocated her arm getting free from Tagata, but she managed. Light bending properties. Pheromone repellent to make people avoid you. That last one caught Melissa's attention. Actually, I hadn't thought of something pheromone related. A time release system could work better than just an applied chemical mixture like perfume. Oh, God, there's two of them now, Power Loader groaned. If she causes explosions, I'm going to kill All Might. Well, at least she made a new friend, Midoriya pointed out, as the two inventors' conversation devolved into technical terms that not even Yayorazu understood. I just hope they don't blow up the school, Ribbit. Asui shrugged. As long as we're not in it, anyway. Thanks again for this, Aizawa said over the phone. I'm sure the students will learn a great deal, right? See you in a few days. So, no problems on their end. Vlad King asked, None. But I'm still not taking any chances with the student's safety. Aizawa sipped his coffee, it was his third cup that day, not that it woke him up much. We're taking each class on a separate route and at different times. Only you, me, and Nezu will know who will be going where and when. You're that concerned about an information leak. Vlad King crossed his arms, his bulging muscles made his skin-tight red outfit creak. We still don't know how the League of Villains knew our schedule for the USJ incident, Aizawa reminded him. This is why we're not putting anything on computer this time, in case there's a hacker involved. If something does happen, we'll know every name on the list of people who are in the know. I can't believe the idea of a traitor is even on the table, Vlad King growled. Personally, I don't think there is, either, but I'd rather be sure. Aizawa glanced longingly at his sleeping bag. But Vlad King was one of the few faculty members who wouldn't let him get away with sleeping through anything. Vlad was actually the only teacher Aizawa thought was stricter than he was. It almost made him pity Class 1B. All right, let's take care of the last of the paperwork, Aizawa said. After that, we're putting our students through hell. The music begins, revealing the gates of UA. The rising stars are just outside, looking up at the gate. Each of them has a serious, determined look on their face, and they take a single step forward. The scene changes to show Midoriya in his school uniform, standing up straight and looking nervous. He is then replaced by an image of him in his costume, hand over the Ultimatrix and ready for action. The background shows brief flashes of his first fight with Bakugo, his battle against Namu, and him punching Wolfram. The next scene is that of Yuraraka, also in her school uniform with a big smile on her face, and then in her costume, her smile replaced by a determined frown. The background shows her fighting Ida, then the villain who tried to recapture Iri, and then her holding an eye island robot over her head. Ida is next, standing ramrod straight in his uniform, and then running in his costume. The background shows him kicking a robot in the entrance exam, then attacking Stain, and then knocking down a door on eye island. Asui replaces him, hunching over in her school uniform, and then leaping through the air in costume, tongue stretching out. The background shows her saving Maitu in the USJ, lifting Ai Guy through the air during the sports festival, and helping Siro on Ai Island. Siro appears, waving in his school uniform, and then shooting a line of tape while in costume. 
The background shows him holding off Kirijiri in the USJ, helping Inko during his internship, and protecting Yayurazu in the server room. Ishido is next, grinning and holding up a peace sign in her school uniform, and then in her costume, skating across the floor on a trail of acid. The background shows her melting the USJ door for Ida, capturing Nezu during the exam, and narrowly avoiding a robot's attacks on the roof of the Eye Island Tower. Todoroki replaces her, looking almost bored in his uniform, but that changes when he is in costume, one side covered in frost, the other in fire. The background shows him using his fire against Armadrillo, his ice against Stain, and both against the horde of robots at Eye Island, as Ishido skates around him. Yeyurazu is last, hands on her hips in her uniform, and then creating a spear from her arm while in costume. The background shows her blocking Todoroki's ice with salt, fighting villains at the USJ, and trapping Ida with a thick chain during the sports festival. Iri, the big three, Melissa, the rest of class 1A and the UA teachers briefly pass by in a line, ending with All Might, whose smile shines and makes the scene turn white for a second. The scene returns to the rising stars as they begin to run to class. Behind them stands Ben. A single tear falls down his face as he flickers and vanishes. Aizawa raised a single eyebrow at the form in front of him. I appreciate that you want to get in a little more training, but tell me again why you wanted to use the pool today. W. Well, Aizawa sensei, we thought it M might be a good idea to head to the training camp as ready as P possible. Midoriya's explanation was rational. But something had Aizawa suspicious. Not of Midoriya, though, his stutter came from addressing an authority figure, not because he was hiding something. No, something was off about Midoriya's companions. Anyone with working eyes could see that Kaminari and Mintu were up to something. Still, as long as they didn't break any rules, Aizawa didn't actually care what they did. With a sigh, he finished signing the permission slip. You have until 5.30, he said. Not a minute more. The three students bowed and then hurried off. Aizawa considered tailing them, but then shrugged it off if the two potential troublemakers did anything. He was sure he'd hear about it soon enough. You know, I'm kind of glad that you two talked me into asking Aizawa-sensei to use the pool, Midoriya said as he, Kaminari and Minta walked out of the locker room in their swim trunks. You are. Kaminari tilted his head. Why is that? Well, it's a good idea to get in any extra training we can. Midoriya smiled at them. Besides, we aren't the only ones who asked to use the pool today. Beads of sweat rolled down the other boys' necks, and they had to wonder if Midoriya knew more than he was letting on. Minta didn't mind doing a bunch of exercise, though he was sure he'd be doing a lot of that at camp, but his real motivation came from when he'd overheard the girls of the class talking about using the pool on Friday. His imagination had run wild with thoughts of the girls in bikinis, and had shared that information with Kaminari. Rather than maybe getting in trouble for spying on the girls, the other boy had suggested making their presence seem legitimate by having permission to be there. That was why they needed Midoriya. The vice president of the class was the perfect cover for them. What do you mean? Kaminari asked, trying to sound nonchalant. Oh, the girls are using the pool today too. Midoriya tilted his head, eyes far too innocent to be genuine. You didn't think I'd know. I'm friends with four of them, and one of them is my girlfriend. That had been a risk for Kaminari and Minta. They knew Midoriya and Yuraka were dating, and there was every possibility that Midoriya was the possessive type. They certainly didn't want to set him off enough to go wrath on them. Minta assured his partner in crime that they just had to keep their eyes from wandering to Yuraka. It hadn't occurred to them that Midoriya might be protective of all of his female friends. Well, that's a surprise. Minta whistled innocently as he picked up his pace. Come on, every minute we spend here talking is a minute we aren't training. Even if Midoriya gets mad, I'll still get Yayorazu in a bikini forever seared into my brain. Mind to try to hide a leer. I'll gladly take any punishment if it means taking that to my grave. Just as Minta and Kaminari exited the tunnel that would lead to the treasure they sought, a new obstacle reared its head. You two are late. Ida chopped the air and nearly smacked Kaminari in the face. You were the ones to suggest this training, yet you were the last to arrive. Sorry about that, Tenya, Midoriya said easily. We just had to confirm this with Aizawa-sensei. Hi, everyone. As it turned out, everyone was the entire class, all engaged in various stretches. Rather than the bikinis Minda had insisted would be there, the girls were wearing the standard and modest UA female swimsuit. Kaminari was disappointed, but Minta didn't care. The girls looked good no matter what they wore. It wasn't fair for just us to train, Midoriya said, and Kaminari would swear to his dying day that the other boy had a knowing look in his eye. So I made sure the entire class got invited. Yayarazu created a whistle and blew into it to get everyone's attention. Now that everyone is here, we'll start with some endurance swimming. 
After that, as you all voted earlier, we'll have a race. The pool was large, but not quite large enough for 20 people to get in the kind of training they were planning, so the class was divided in half. While Midoriya was swimming, he didn't notice Ashido gently elbow Yuraraka. So, is this the first time you've seen Midori shirtless, or are you just yawning for a really long time? Yuraraka's jaw snapped shut, and she glared at her friend, though it lost its potency because of her intense blush. Yes, Midoriya had some well-defined muscles now, but she was allowed to ogle her boyfriend a little, wasn't she? Well, what about Shoto? She asked. You've been staring at him since he got here. Ashido slung an arm around Yuraraka's shoulders and winked. He is hot. She leaned in closer to whisper in her ear. By the way, he asked me out on another date this morning. Yuraraka smiled. Really? When and where? After the training camp. But I'm totally stealing his first kiss before then. Ashido grinned. A moonlit night in the woods it'll be so romantic. You and Midori better take advantage of that setting while you can. Yuraraka's blush returned. You know Aizawa sensei will be keeping an eye on all of us. He knows you two are dating. He's not gonna be a wet blanket. Ashido frowned. Probably, I hope. Maybe you should be careful where you're kissing. She shook her head. Oh, did Sue tell you that she was planning to make a move on Hanta during camp? No, but I'm glad. Yuraraka's smile was a little evil. I can finally get back at you two for all the teasing. At least we're not being clueless about our feelings, unlike you. Ashido paused to watch as the other half of the class got out of the pool and made finger guns at Todoroki as he toweled off. See what I mean? Yuraraka tried to hide a laugh when Todoroki, face completely stoic, slowly winked, sending Ashido into a sputtering mess. Yeah, I don't have any dirt on you at all she frowned. Hey, where did mine to go? I don't feel safe if I don't know where he is. Ashido looked around. I don't believe it. Bakugo is keeping him in line. Sure enough, Bakugo was sitting next to Minta as he waited for his half of the class turn to use the pool. His hand rested on the back of Minta's neck, and it could have been Yuraraka's imagination, but she could have sworn that some smoke was rising from that hand. Okay, he might be a royal jackass, but he just earned some points for that. Ashido frowned. Why is he on Minta duty? Oh, we worked that out a while ago, Kirishima said as he toweled off, near enough to overhear them. We've got a schedule for who keeps Minta in line and it's Bakugo's turn today. There's a schedule. Ashido didn't know whether to be shocked or laugh. Most of the time we don't have to do anything, so you probably wouldn't notice, Kirishima explained. It's only when we think he'll be worse than usual. Like here, also, Midoriya gave us a heads up this morning, so we were prepared. Ashido smiled at him. You guys are all great. As Yuraraka got ready to take her turn in the pool, she thought she'd be a little forward and winked at Midoriya. It was a little ruined by her heavy blush, but it got the desired effect. Midoriya's face went red, and he tried to hide behind his towel. I'll have to give more thought about that romantic night in the woods, she told herself. After getting thoroughly warmed up, the class was divided into groups of five for the race. There would be four heats, and then a final race between the four winners. Bakugo set a precedent when he used his quirk to propel himself over the water to win handily. There were some arguments over whether or not that was cheating but the rules hadn't stated the swimmers actually had to swim. Ciro had gotten into the spirit of things by using his tape to pull himself over the water, but lost to Asui. She came dangerously close to cheating by leaping out of the water so that she was level with Ciro, and winked, causing him to lose focus and fall into the water, giving Asui the win. Ida narrowly beat Todoroki by balancing on the pool dividers and using a full power recipro burst, though he nearly crashed into the far wall because of too much momentum. He was only saved from hurting himself because Yuraraka tagged him with her own quirk, and he ended up corkscrewing through the air, and into the pool after gravity was restored for him. Midoriya found himself racing Yeyurazu, Takoyami, Hagakure, and Koda. Since everyone else was using their quirks, he decided to play at that level. He activated the Ultimatrix and cycled through his aliens until he found XLR8. However, when he transformed, he found that he'd turned into four arms. Wait, what? I thought for sure that I'd picked XLR8. What's going on? Before he could think on it further, Kirishima blew on the whistle, signaling the start of the race. Even though he wasn't the alien he'd wanted, four arms' powerful muscles allowed him to easily outpace the others. However, as he pulled himself out of the water and turned back to normal, he thought he heard a crackling noise from the Ultimatrix. Tears from his swimsuit-wearing girlfriend took his mind off the watch, though he made a mental note to ask Ben about it later. Hey, Izuku. Asui stretched next to him as they got ready for the final race. How come you didn't turn into Rip Jaws or Water Hazard, Ribbit? Well, they have gills, so chlorinated water was probably a bad idea, Midoriya said, though he didn't add that he might not have turned into them, even if he'd wanted to. 
As the finalists got ready, Midoriya activated the Ultimatrix again. This time, he turned into XLR8, but he was still a little apprehensive. Gei Yurazu blew the whistle to start, but when they tried to use their powers, they simply dropped into the water. At first, everyone was confused, until they saw Aizawa standing by the entrance, his own quirk active. You've been here long enough, he said. Go home and get ready for an early start tomorrow. Interesting. He thought as XLR8 dragged himself out of the water and turned back to normal. My quirk kept him from using his speed, but his transformation didn't end. Then again, his quirk is insane, so I wouldn't be surprised if he had emitter, transformation and mutant characteristics. He may be the hardest to train during the camp. Shigaraki usually didn't get nervous. The last time he could remember getting anxious was when he'd failed a test that All for One had presented to him, but that had quickly faded when his master didn't get angry and only showed him how he could do better. However, he was as close to nervous as he'd been in a long time, simply because of the raw power of the individuals in front of him, and he could count on the loyalty of only one of them. Intellectually, he knew that having a smaller core of powerful villains was more efficient than running a huge mob of weaker pawns, but it wasn't helpful to think about how a good number of his potential allies were strong enough to challenge him. Nearly everyone is here, he said, infusing his voice with as much confidence as he could. We're only missing one. Kurajiri bowed his head. My apologies, but in order to ensure the cooperation of the last one, the doctor had to fulfill his part of the bargain you struck. He will be unable to join us for this operation. That's a shame. Shigaraki tapped the hand on his face with one finger. Then again, his power is a little too flashy for what I have in mind. But you are going to send us out, right, Shigaraki? Toga Himiko leaned forward in her chair. Eyes wide and smile wider, her sharpened incisors glinted in the bar's dim light. You promised that we'd be able to actually do something. Shigaraki raised a single eyebrow. Toga had been one of the first of his new recruits, and at the time, he thought they wouldn't get any crazier than her. He wasn't the most socially adept, but even he could see that Toga had Psycho Stalker written all over her. The girl, no older than 16 or 17, was of average height, with blonde hair tied up in two messy buns. She wore a school uniform, complete with a too large cardigan that Shigaraki had quickly learned contained more than a few knives. Regardless of her instabilities and Shigaraki was honest enough to admit that everyone present had a few screws loose once she finally revealed her quirk, she had quickly become one of Shigaraki's top lieutenants. I did promise that, and I keep my word. When I have to, and it benefits me, he thought. I've chosen the members of the team, and you're on it. We just need to go over the plan. Once I'm sure there won't be any problems, I'll give you the go-ahead. A man wearing black pants, an orange shirt, a black vest and matching top hat, and an elaborate mask tilted his head. And why, pray tell, won't you be joining us on this mission? You are our leader, after all. Shigaraki inclined his head at Mr. Compress. Think of this as a test for all of us. I need to be able to trust you, which means I can't be hands-on all the time. If you stick to my plan and pull this off, you'll have that trust. Sounds good to me. A well-built man in a black bodysuit with stylized stripes then shook his head and spoke in a higher-pitched voice. This whole thing is gonna go to hell. No one commented on Twice's odd behavior. They'd all gotten used to it by now. Anyway, the Vanguard squad will be transported to the safe house tomorrow morning, Shigaraki said. Everyone else will stay here. Any questions before we go over the details? I do. One of the villains in the back stepped out of the shadows. Most of his body was covered by a long trench coat, but it couldn't hide his claws, wolf-like head, or his long crocodile's tail. You haven't told us why kidnapping this kid in particular is so important. If we want to prove how serious we are, why not take any of them? Better yet, why not just kill them? Spinner, a man with a quirk that made him look like a humanoid lizard with long pink hair, scowled and made to draw the abomination he called a weapon from his back. Shigaraki stopped him with one lazily raised hand and looked Chimera in the eye. In reverse order if we kill them, every hero in the country will come down on us and we're just not ready for that kind of fight. Some of the league looked like they wanted to argue that point, but Shigaraki kept going. And it sends the wrong message. We need to give these kids the chance to actually become heroes. If they turn out to be unworthy, then we'll kill them. Though he appeared calm, Shigaraki was seething as he spoke Stan's creed. He actually would have been perfectly fine if every one of those UA students died. But a good number of the League had joined because they believed that Stain and Shigaraki were in accord. Until he was sure that his followers were more loyal to him over Stain's ideals, Shigaraki had to play it safe. Then there's your other question. 
we all know how much damage heroes like Hawks, Endeavor, and especially All might have done to criminal organizations. Knowing what you do now, would you pass up the chance to take one of them out before they became trained? Shigaraki could tell that many of the villains were quick to agree with him. Now, I'd love to make sure that a kid this powerful never becomes a hero, and the safest way to do that would be to kill him. So why don't we? Kaimira asked. Shigaraki pointed to the television in the corner. Instantly, even the most bloodthirsty of the league settled down because he wants the kid alive. Besides, kidnapping him will make sure that people will have doubts about him before he even becomes a pro, assuming he survives. That kind of thing will end a career as quickly as any injury. Satisfied, Chimera backed down, but Shigaraki made a note to watch him. Several within the league, including Chimera, were powerful enough to challenge him for leadership, and several more were arrogant or crazy enough to try anyway. If there's nothing else, let's go over the plan. Shigaraki paused and looked each villain in the eye. Just remember none of the kids can die. You can rough them up, even cripple them, but dead kids are just martyrs to the cause. A young man with black hair and some of the most horrific burns Shigaraki had ever seen tilted his head. What about the pros? Oh, them. Shigaraki smiled behind the hand on his face. Kill them all. Izuku's attention was divided between eating his breakfast and checking his phone. Even though they would all be at school soon, the rising stars couldn't stop messaging each other. Crayon, I'm so excited tape, and I just can't hide it. Crayon, nice. Tape, thanks. Book, does everyone have everything they need? Frog, if we forget something, you could just make a new one for us, Ribbit. Glasses, Sue, that is an improper use of a quirk. Comet, I can imagine you chopping as you say that, Tenya. Comet, and I could barely eat breakfast, I was so excited. All Might, I still just want to know where we're going, and what we'll do for training. Snowflake, probably somewhere in the woods, or in the mountains, and I imagine a lot of sparring or something. Book, I would not be surprised if each of us was given a specific training regimen for our individual quirks and skills. Comet, then Deku-kun is going to be really busy. Crayon, no passing out Midori. If you do, you can't make out W, Achako. All Might, I guess that's a really good reason to stay strong. Crayon, aw, he didn't freak out. Comet, remember, Mina, Shoto has to do extra training. Don't overwhelm him early, or you won't get far. Crayon, Alshde Odso. Frog, time to surrender, Mina. I've beaten you, Ribbit. Izuku laughed and almost choked on his food. He would have kept going in the chat, but his phone was yanked away and into his mother's hand. You can use your phone, or you can eat, and I'd rather you not be hungry before you even start training. Inko tried to look stern, but she couldn't hide her smile. Mom, what's up? I'm just so proud of you, she said. Every day, it seems like you're a step closer to your dream. Izuku's own smile was wobbly. I know, and I'm so thankful to everyone who helped me get this far. Both Ben's, my friends, Hawks, Nezu-sensei and you. Inko rushed over and gave her son a big hug. Just remember to have fun, okay? I want you to relax a little, or you'll be wound too tight. I will, mom. Good. Inko smiled evilly. And make sure to pay attention to Achako-chan. Girls like a boy who's driven, but not if it gets them ignored. Mom, Inko laughed, and then tapped the ultimatrix. You'll keep him out of trouble, won't you, Ben? Ben flickered into view and sat in a chair. I'll do my best, but Izuku has a habit of doing crazy thing 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 things. Izuku and Inko both looked at him worriedly. Despite Ben's insistence otherwise, his glitches seemed to be getting worse. It also hadn't escaped their notice that he projected his hologram less, and tended to speak only when directly addressed. However, every time they asked, Ben just deflected any questions, or claimed that his programming refused to let him answer. Though they still trusted him, they also suspected that Ben was lying to them about something, and had been for some time. While Inko didn't want to confront her surrogate second son, Izuku became determined to do just that when he got a chance. If something was wrong with his best friend, practically his brother by that point then he wanted to help. We'll see you in a couple of weeks, mom, Izuku said, not so subtly changing the subject and I'll be even stronger. Inko smiled. Careful, Izuku. People might think you're aiming for All Might's spot before you're even out of high school. No, I'll settle for taking Endeavor's place in the ratings for now. He meant it as a joke, of course, but part of him was still furious and disgusted with Endeavor after what Todoroki had told him. Inko laughed and gave her son a hug. I love you, Izuku. I love you too, mom. There was a palpable excitement in the air as class won a gathered by the buses. Even the six students that had failed the exam were chipper, though they tried to look more subdued whenever Aizawa so much as glanced at them. For most students, this would be a time to rest and relax, Aizawa reminded them all. But you've chosen a harder path in life, so you don't get that kind of break. 
even after this training camp, you'll be expected to keep up with extra studying and physical exercise. If I think you've been slipping, I'll find someone more responsible to take your place. With his piece said, Aizawa made his way onto the bus, presumably to catch a quick nap. Somewhat chastised, Class 1 moved their things into the storage area on the bus, but they were still eager. What do you want to do first, Deku-kun? Uraraka asked, S mores or stories? See can we have both? Midoriya smiled, and then blushed when Uraraka gently bumped her shoulder against him. You just want more opportunities to snuggle, she accused. Is th that a be bad thing? No, but it is cute. Further flirting was cut short when an unexpected guest joined the class. Hey, Shinso greeted tiredly as he dragged a suitcase behind him. Shinso-san. Midoriya blinked, he'd only seen the other boy a few times since the sports festival. What are you doing here? Well, I guess I did well enough in the sports festival to get Aizawa Sensei's attention. He's willing to give me a chance as a probationary hero course student until the end of the year, and then it might be permanent. He shrugged. I guess that recommendation you gave after the festival helped too, so thanks. Midoriya looked away. Embarrassed, he had almost forgotten that he had asked Aizawa to give Shinso a chance. He and Yeirazu had created a rational, well-thought-out proposal that included how the UA entrance exam didn't account for people with quirks not suited for combat. Aizawa had eventually caved and told them that he'd consider it, but there had been no further word after that. Midoriya had been too busy with internships, the revelations about quirks, Iri, and everything else to follow up. It w was n nothing, really. Midoriya smiled nervously. I'm glad you're joining us, Shinso-san. What's this? A voice that had all of Class 1 on edge cut into the conversation. The renowned Class 1 has an extra member. Why? It's almost like you need the help. Yeyarazu gave Monoma a piercing look, complete with a raised eyebrow, that Ashido had dubbed her superior rich girl glare. Is there something you want, Monoma-san? The Class 1B boy sneered, just confirming that the vaunted Class 1A really did fail during the exams as badly as I'd heard. Six of you were unable to pass, yet all but one Class B student succeeded. How strange, when you're supposed to be superior to, Irk. Everyone blinked when Kendo ended Monoma's tirade with a quick chop to the neck that sent him sprawling. Sorry about that. He's getting better at avoiding me, I need to hit him harder. Kinky, Minda whispered, only for Asui to slap him with her tongue. H. Hi, Kendo-san, Midoriya said to break the tension, as the rest of Class 1B arrived. Wait, are we all going to the same training camp? I guess so. Kendo enlarged one of her hands to easily pick up the semi-conscious Monoma. No one told us you'd be going with us, we all kinda thought our classes would go to different camps. This is most fortuitous, Shizaki commented. Her hands clasped together. It is a sign that our classes will break down the walls dividing us, despite the disruptive elements we have. Students from both classes glanced at Monoma, and then at Maita. The former was being dragged into a bus, while the latter was already bound with Siro's tape and being manhandled by Kirishima. W.L., I guess we'll see you all at camp, Midoriya said, Tetsu Tetsu and Shizaki smiled, while Kendo waved as she finished tossing Monoma onto the bus. All right, that's enough excitement. Yeyorazu waved to get her class attention. Everyone, please get onto the bus, we have a long drive ahead of us. Aizawa had warned his students, and possible future student, that they would be driving for an hour before their first break. The students took the opportunity to chat, joke, or just relax. At first, Midoriya was happy to spend time with his friends. But after about 20 minutes, he yawned. The other rising stars, taking up the seats behind, ahead, and to the side of his, all looked at him in concern. Did you have a hard time sleeping too, Deku-kun? Uraraka asked, she was on the seat attached to his. I kept thinking about today, so it took forever to fall asleep. Midoriya nodded. Yeah, I kept checking that I had everything packed. Yeyorazu turned around in her seat in front of them and smiled. Why don't you two take a nap? We'll wake you when we stop. Thanks, Momo. Uraraka hesitated, then rested her head on her boyfriend's shoulder. After a minute, her breathing leveled out, and she was asleep. It took Midoriya a bit longer to calm down. After all, his girlfriend had just fallen asleep on him, and he didn't really know how to deal with that. Uraraka had rested against him before, but that had been a show of affection. This felt much more intimate. Still, he eventually calmed down, leaned back, and closed his eyes. He thought he felt his cheek rest against something soft, but by then, he was fast asleep. It only felt like a few minutes before he felt someone tap his shoulder to wake him up, rather than a hand like he expected. It was Asui's tongue. Aizawa Sensei says that we're here, Ribbit. Asui's face was its usual blank state, but Midoriya had known her long enough to tell when she was amused. You should wake up Achako. Midoriya blinked as he tried to figure out what was so funny. 
Once he was fully awake, he realized that Yuraraka had shifted around in her sleep. She was partially on his lap, and she was hugging him tightly. Er, Achako, Midoriya gently shook his girlfriend. Achako-chan, the endearing suffix was enough to wake Yuraraka. She blinked sleepily and adorably to Midoriya's eyes and then realized what she was doing. She jumped back like Midoriya had suddenly caught fire. Yes, what? Everything's fine. Then Midoriya started to float, so Yuraraka had to quickly release her quirk. Um, yes. Yuraraka's face was unbelievably red, and if the heat Midoriya felt was any indication, his was probably the same. It's time to get off the bus. The break. Remember. Oh, right. Yuraraka stood up, smoothed out her skirt, and bolted for the door. See you outside. Midoriya took a shuddering breath. He and Yuraraka had gotten pretty comfortable with each other since they'd started dating, but neither had gone farther than hugging and kissing. Suddenly, the idea of spending two weeks with his girlfriend in a camp was raising all kinds of feelings for Midoriya. He slapped himself a couple of times to snap out of it and joined everyone else outside. Thankfully, other than a slight blush, Yuraraka seemed to have gotten over it and even laughed a little. As the students stretched out stiff muscles, they started to notice something off. Hey, of Kaminari looked around. This doesn't look like a rest stop. He was right. Instead of a gas station or convenience store to take a break by, they were parked by a small cliff that overlooked a large forest. There was nothing else on the road, except for a car parked in front of the bus, and it was only Class 1A's bus. Class B's was nowhere to be seen. Midoriya had known Aizawa long enough to become just a little suspicious. Mainto, on the other hand, was a little too preoccupied to be thinking about that. Aizawa-sensei, the short boy said as he squirmed in place, where's the bathroom? You didn't think we stopped just to rest, did you? Aizawa's mouth was hidden by his capture tool, but even Yuraraka would have bet money that he was smiling cruelly. Hey, eraser. The doors to the car opened. Been a while, huh? Aizawa nodded. Yeah, thanks again for all this. The entire class stared as two women jumped out of the car. Both wore outfits that wouldn't have been out of place on cheerleaders, with short skirts and high-cut tops. One wore red, and the other wore blue. Both had metal headpieces that looked like cat ears, big cat paw gloves, and cat tails. Your feline fantasies have arrived. The one in red, a brunette with red markings on her face, winked. The one in blue, a blonde with a visor over her eyes, grinned. Perfectly cute and cat-like girls. We're. Both women struck a pose. The wild, wild pussycats. The entire routine was ruined somewhat by the little boy who stood behind them. His face was shadowed by his red hat, but he looked thoroughly fed up with everything. Midoriya didn't notice the boy, though. He was too excited to see part of a popular pro hero team. The wild, wild pussycats. I don't believe it. They're a really successful rescue team, and they've maintained their place in the rankings ever since they debuted 12 years. Oomph. The blonde woman was suddenly in front of him, one paw clamped over his mouth. I'm 18 at heart, understand. Something told Midoriya that contradicting this woman would be detrimental to his health, so he just nodded. Anyway, Aizawa said, looking almost as done as the young boy, these are two of the four hero team that will be helping to train you all. Follow their instructions, and maybe they'll turn you into decent heroes in training. He nodded at the brunette. Mandalay, I'll leave the next part up to you and Pixie Bob. Sure thing, eraser. Mandalay grinned at the students and gestured to the forest behind her. We own this whole area. You'll be training mostly at the camp, which is at the base of that mountain. The students had to take her word for it, since the camp was concealed by the dense forest. However, all of them began to get more and more suspicious. Um, if the camp is that far away Yuraraka shared a nervous glance with her friends. Why did we stop all the way out here? Because Aizawa isn't the only one who likes to be cruel, ribbit, Asui sighed. Back on the bus, Siro said, grabbing Asui by the arm and moving away. Back on the bus, before it's too late. Other students followed his lead, but Pixie Bob was blocking their path. On their other side, Mandalay popped out claws from her gloves. It's about 9.30, she purred. If you hurry, you might make it the camp by noon, but if you don't arrive by 12.30, you won't get lunch. Pixie Bob grinned maniacally and put her paws on the ground. There was a brief glow, and then the soil erupted into a landslide that carried the class off the cliff. There were screams, shrieks, and not a little cursing as the students landed in a pile of dust and tangled limbs. That bitch, that Hugo's hand sparked as he prepared to launch himself back up to give Pixie Bob a piece of his mind. Hold on, man. Hiroshima and Sato grabbed him before he did something he'd regret. Mandalay poked her head over the cliff, unconcerned with Bakugo's temper. By the way, since this land is privately owned, you can use your quirks as much as you want. 
You'll need to, if you want to survive the beast's forest. Midoriya paused in the middle of dusting himself off and shared a concerned look with his friends. Beast's forest. Okay, I am officially done with Aizawa sensei and his crap, Ashido growled. Look on the bright side, Todoroki muttered. At least we can take it out on anything that tries to stop us. Is your class always this insane? Shinso asked. Welcome to hero training, newbie, Siro said. Aizawa sensei just tossed you into the deep end. At the edge of the forest, Minta sighed as he hid behind a tree. Somehow, through some miracle of self-control, he had gone through that entire ordeal without emptying his bladder. All he had to do now was find a nice, secluded spot, and he would be good. 4. It was at that moment that Minta looked up and saw an enormous, snarling monster staring down at him. It was understandable that he finally lost the battle to control his bladder, and he screamed. It seems the name is well earned, Yeirazu said, though her own fear was tempered when she saw Minter running away with a massive dark stain between his legs. Toda rushed forward, arms outstretched. Please, calm yourself, great beast. We mean you no harm. For a moment, Midoriya thought that Koda's ability to control animals would work, but then he saw patches of dirt fall from the monster's body. That triggered his encyclopedic knowledge of heroes and quirks. Don't waste your breath, Koda san he shouted, as more creatures stomped into view. That's Pixie Bob's quirk. She can control dirt in any way she wants. I guess this is why Mandalay said it would take us so long to reach the camp, Yuraraka said. Bakugo grinned. And since we can use our quirks however we want, we can just kill these things. Yeah, let's hurry up and blow past them. Kirishima's arms hardened, and he readied himself to charge. Screw that, let's have some fun. Bakugo launched himself into the air. Whoever gets the most kills wins. Yeyurazu sighed. While I hate to agree with Bakugo, this would be a good way to start our training. All right, class A. Eater rolled up his pants, and his engine started to growl. Let's go. Yeah. Midoriya slammed his hand down on the ultimatrix. He was surprised when he turned into Cannonbolt instead of Human Gaussor, but he had no time to ponder the watch's newest malfunction. He curled up and rolled out, slamming into the first monster, before bouncing off a few trees and into another. Each impact made a huge crater that destabilized the dirt and destroyed the construct. Ida kicked his quirk-propelled leg through the head of one monster, then accepted a high five from Yuraraka and flew through the air to tear off the wing of another. The damage constructed started to rise, but Yuraraka made a log weightless and used it to beat the thing into dust. Asui and Siro used their quirks to entangle the legs of another construct that looked like a small Brachiosaurus, holding it down long enough for Ishido to melt it in half. Nearby, Todoroki froze two more constructs, destroying one, and holding the other in place so that Yeirazu could destroy it with a cannon she created. The rest of the class enthusiastically threw themselves at the growing number of monsters. Even gentle Kota sent flocks of birds to tear chunks of soil away, and Hagakure snuck around so that she could kick a construct in the head. She didn't do much damage, but she could distract them long enough for a heavy hitter to finish the job. Even Minda fought fiercely, screaming obscenities as he hurled his balls to trap constructs, though his efforts were less impressive with his wet pants. Come on, losers. Beck Hugo cackled as he blasted apart one construct after another. I've already killed six of these things. Good for you, Cannonbolt said, rolling past him. I've got eight. Screw you, Deco. Beck Hugo screamed in fury as he rocketed toward two more monsters. These ones are hay. I called those, raccoon eyes. Ashido stuck her tongue out as the sizzling remains of the constructs fell around her. Too bad, so sad, you mad. Cannonbolt waited until Bakugo stormed off spouting curses, but impressively, never repeating himself once before sharing a low five with Ashido. By the way, she continued, I'm on seven, Midori. If you're not careful, I'll catch up. Cannonbolt curled up and rolled off. Not a chance. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part nine. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.